Good afternoon. My name is Dean Godson. I'm Director of Policy Exchange. It's my pleasure to be able to welcome all of you to our inaugural History Matters uh, conference. When uh, we started this project uh, in the middle of last year, when uh, this issue erupted on the scene, we thought uh, perhaps with a degree of optimism like Troops Home Christmas 1914 on all sides that this would uh, be over relatively quickly and indeed that formed uh, the original uh, part of discussion with the chairman of the project and we're delighted to welcome here today Trevor Phillips when we had this uh, perhaps uh, optimistic view of uh, how long the issue would remain in the forefront of the public consciousness but it has remained in the forefront of public consciousness and the quality of the and quantity of the audience here today and of the panel here today is testimony sufficient of the salience uh, of this issue in the national debate, whatever side one's coming from on this. And the purpose of the History Matters project, in the first instance, for those of you who've been following it and for those of you who haven't, is to provide a fortnightly newsletter, History Matters newsletter, which takes people through just a documentary record of what's been happening in this space and in three particular categories. The first, um, which of course was perhaps most dramatically illustrated by the events of last year, statues and the public space, but it goes uh, much wider than that, of course, to museums and galleries and to education, primary, secondary and tertiary. Today's conference, this inaugural uh, conference, will focus on the statues and public space and then on the museums and galleries, and we have two outstanding panels to address that, and we'll conclude the latter part of the uh, proceedings with an in-conversation between Trevor Phillips and uh, Secretary of State for uh, DCMS, Oliver Dowden, who's uh, played already a significant part in this uh, discussion as far as the government, obviously, is concerned. Our purpose here today, although many individuals, both on the panels and the audiences, have particular, particular views on history matters and the role, uh, negative, positive, or otherwise, or neutral, of key historical figures. That's not our purpose to get here today, to uh, vindicate the memory of any one individual to denounce it. The purpose here today is to tease out what the public policy solutions are, what the approaches might be, and uh, to ascertain what actually you know, further teasing out of what is happening on the ground at the moment. And that applies uh, also various uh, things, although it's not our purpose of a particular session today. That will be the next conference, for example, in the education space, to find out what kind of a more a clearer, more accurate, deeper, wider perspective, for example, on what is happening at all levels of the education system, primary, secondary, and tertiary. But today, as I say, the purpose is the public space, statues, museums, and galleries. My great pleasure to hand over to Trevor Phillips, who's done so outstanding a job as chair of our History Matters uh, project. And Trevor will give uh, a few further words of introduction now, and then we'll be handing over to our individual panels. So thank you, Trevor. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Dean, um, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'd like to start by saying a few words about why we started this project, uh, about what we are doing, and about what we are not doing. And finally, about the manner in which I hope we might all work together to learn about and learn from the past. Uh, I'm hoping that you can hear me, um, but uh, the policy exchange will let me know if I'm on. Thank you. Last summer, after a series of media controversies about the toppling of statues that uh, Dean referred to and the nature of certain museum and cultural displays, the team here at Policy Exchange, as is our wont, decided to see if we could separate the signal from the noise. There seemed to be a shortage of genuine knowledge about what was actually being proposed. So we thought the first step should be simply to record in the words of the various universities, authorities, councils, museum boards, and others, what changes were actually under consideration. And you'll note, those of you who have read uh, our work, that the record is published without commentary from us. Now, Dean was right about our initial optimism. I don't think that any of us imagined that we would still be recording such matters now 
nine months later, much less that our fortnightly compendium would have grown in size and scale in the way it has done. But I think this is just one illustration of what most people have learned from the last 10 years or so, crystallized in the decision to leave the EU, the referendum on Scottish independence, and perhaps in the past year, the currency of the Black Lives Matter movement. Deciding what kind of nation we are isn't just a matter of pounds and pence. It is also a matter of who and what we want to be. I know that we're all talking budget this week, but to use an old biblical saw, man does not live by bread alone. For many in our nation, what also matters are questions about what we now call social identity. What binds us to our fellow citizens? Do those ties still bind? And are they relevant to our future well-being and prosperity? The answers to such questions do not lie in 280-character social media exchanges. They are to be found in a deep and deeper understanding of how we got here. That, I think, is why the understanding of our shared past seems so hotly contested today. It will help us to determine what we want to keep for the present, as well as what we want to advocate for the future. But in reaching that understanding, there's plenty of room for creative disagreement. As the great historian of medicine, Roy Porter, wrote, the historical record is like the night sky. We see a few stars and group them together into mythic constellations. But what is chiefly visible is the darkness. In short, by looking back, we may learn something to help us find a way through that misty, uncharted territory we call the future. But the problem is that not everyone recalls the route in the same way. For example, if you were a man on a horse, the journey will have felt very different than if you were a woman on foot carrying a small child. So we need to find ways to talk to each other respectfully and generously across lines of race, of class, of age, so that we can all understand both the objective reality and the subjective experience of that past. Simply mining certain elements of history in order to create your own ideological amalgam just won't do. So when I look at the almost 200 items that we've reported during the past eight or nine months, there's no doubt where accounts of the journey most differ. Issues of race, empire, and colonialism arise again and again. It would be overly simplistic to say that most history is the history of empires, but in our case, in this country, it would be fatuous to avoid the significance of this long part of our own journey. I don't want to preempt the panel debate, but I'd like to say a few words about why this matters to me personally. Um, I know that I look like a spring chicken, but I am actually a child of empire, born into a colonial family. In 1953, which is the year I was born in London, my parents' home, British Guyana then, had been under a state of emergency for months, with British troops on the streets. One of my own relatives was detained in prison for most of that period. The father of one of my closest school friends, the poet Martin Carter, was in jail with him. I was sent back to Georgetown as a baby, so I spent most of my first 18 years under colonial rule. I keep a picture on my desk to remind me who I am, and it is of me as a barefoot six-year-old on my cousin's back in the yard of our family home. Our home is what people would today call a shack. There is no indoor toilet. We have what is what we called a latrine, a shed, a hole, and a bucket of lime. I didn't see an indoor toilet until I was seven and visited my parents in England. So I fully grasp what it meant to be subject to colonial rule, and I have absolutely no illusions about its meaning. So while I respect all informed opinion, I hope you'll forgive me today if I give less weight to the views of those for whom the experience of colonial oppression amounts to an occasional encounter with a lump of carved stone in an ancient university town on their way to dinner at high table. Maybe this is me flaunting black privilege, but I don't get the chance that often. Today, we hear a great deal about the effects of racism from people born decades after the Bristol bus boycott in 1963 forced the adoption of the first anti-discrimination laws in the UK. Many seem to think the worst N-word 
on record in the English language has six letters, or maybe five if you're a rapper. Actually, the worst N-word has two letters. No blacks, no Irish, no dogs, no Jews, no renting this flat to you. No job in the local authority. No mortgages, despite your perfect credit history. Today, it also means no black bosses in the FTSE 100, no people of color running the media, no black professors in many universities, no black heads of major museums who flaunt their, uh, their conscience in front of us, and no from the computer program that decides whether you get a business loan or not. So what has this got to do with history? Well, I think it tells us that if we ignore or misreport the past, we misunderstand what matters about the present. For example, we begin to believe that campaigning about a statue that no one has noticed in decades is more important than working to fix an education system that rewards those who already have the lion's share of society's gifts. We worry more about the placement of a philanthropist's memorial than whether the school children who visit it are able to read and write well enough to make their own judgment about the past. I get it that many people believe that many of these monuments and displays are off putting to some. But here again, a misreading of history disrespects our parents and forebears. I mentioned the Bristol bus boycott of 1963, le led by Paul Stevenson. When my brother and I interviewed Paul and the veterans of that campaign for our book, Windrush, I really do not recall any of them saying that the thousands who walked to work every day for weeks protesting against the color bar were affronted by statues of dead white men. What they were insulted by was the insinuation by the bus companies and the trades unions that black men could not be trusted to travel at night with white women. Which aspect of history, the statue or the bus boycott, should our children really be alerted to today? History should help us to get things in perspective. At the very least, we should never insult those previous generations, black, brown, white, by saying nothing has changed. For what it's worth, I think that even where some of us do feel offense, we should also remember the effect of wiping those constellations, as Porter had it, from the collective memory or the symbols of those constellations. For anyone born into con colonialism, the need for everyone to be constantly reminded of what took place could not be greater. To be plain, I do not want to be complicit in encouraging white amnesia. The apology by a head teacher for using the word Negro removes the scholarship of W.E.B. Du Bois, the wisdom of Martin Luther King, and the literature of Toni Morrison all of whom used that word from that head teacher's students. So that is much of the best of black America canceled at a stroke. I read this morning that an educational publisher is banning the words master and slave from its books. So much for me being able to remind you that William Gladstone's family, who probably owned many of my ancestors, were our masters when we were slaves. It seems that my lived experience still takes second place to others' sensibilities, and that black lives are once again being censored for the comfort of others. At Policy Exchange, we are trying to promote an open and comprehensive debate, a debate based on evidence, but where every piece of evidence is open to challenge, one that accepts that we may disagree, but if we do disagree, it should be because of what we know, not because of the color of our skins one in which we strive for a common language, but where speech is not constrained by some artificial conformity of opinion. Our universities and cultural institutions should be centers that open minds rather than close them. Unfortunately, some now license their employees to use racial epithets about others. Yes, I am speaking about Birmingham City University, one of whose professors regularly accuses other people of color of being coons. I am speaking about Cambridge University, whose academics are happy to call people by racist names and think nothing of applying demeaning racial stereotypes to one of policy exchanges researchers, a brilliant young woman of an Ethiopian background. 
Universities, museums, and other cultural institutions can't complain about politicians taking a view about the spending of taxpayers' money if at one and the same time they encourage their employees to denigrate young black men and women for the impertinence of challenging their orthodoxy. In some ways, this is the worst of it. The writer Kazuo Ishikuro said yesterday in an interview that whilst he himself is protected by age and reputation, a climate of fear is inhibiting creative freedom and encouraging self-censorship. He said, and I'm quoting, a very much, I very much fear for the younger generation of writers. I think this is a dangerous state of affairs. One last point before I uh, yield the floor. It is alleged that we, and I think me specifically, have used the word woke incorrectly. This mostly comes from people who I don't think had any idea what it meant when I wrote about it four years ago, the start of the Trump era. But let's not make a big deal about that. The difference between us is very simple, and it does relate to the way we deal with the past. Some believe that our response to contested history should be to hide from it. That is the position of the woke. If something can be said to cause offence, it must be removed. If someone causes offence, they should be cancelled. I believe that we should confront our history every day and all day. We should learn about it and learn from it. And we cannot do that if we bury it. Sometimes we will want to build on it by explanation or by addition. Similarly, with those who do not share our opinions, we should debate them vigorously without quarter, but also without rancor. So at the heart of our discussion today lies this question. Do we spend our time subtracting from the past or adding to the future? Do we get to a better, more equal society by lifting real live people up or by tearing dead people down? As one great historic figure said, let the dead bury the dead. As one who does believe that black lives matter, I want to spend my time worrying about how we chart a better future for those who are with us now. That is why history should matter and what I hope will be the basis of our discussions today. In a few seconds, we will uh, be hearing from Peter Ainsworth and his uh, panel. Uh, I'm looking forward to joining you again with the Secretary of State. For the moment, thank you.
well, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, this session, um, which is about statues and the public space. But I'd just like to say that I don't know how many of you were able to listen to what Trevor Phillips just said. I personally found it incredibly wise and generous and and funny, uh, but also trenchant uh, and quite moving, in fact. Uh, and I hope we can capture that. I thought it was a brilliant introduction to this very difficult and contentious topic. Um, I'd like to thank the Policy Exchange who have done an, a phenomenal amount of work in this area and um, uh, uh, produced an enormous number of case studies. I mean, far too many, many to go into. Uh, they've suggested that I suggest three uh, for these purposes. Uh, one is the renaming of um, Havelock Road in Ealing. I mean, General Havelock was a sort of colonial uh, veteran of far-flung contact con uh, wars and uh, 19th century conflicts. Um, and Ealing Council have decided to rename him in favour, actually, of Guru Nanak. Now, nobody has anything against Guru Nanak at all. Um, but is that a good thing to do? Um, I don't know. Um, there's the question of Thomas Guy, um, huge benefactor, not only to obviously St. Thomas's Hospital, but also um, to education, particularly in Tamworth. Um, I gather the application made by the hospital to take down his statue has now been withdrawn. Um, did they make the right decision? Is that now uh, a finished uh, process? And then there's the Melville Monument in Edinburgh uh, to the first Viscount Melville, who apparently, I mean, history is so contentious, had no personal involvement in the slave trade, um, and, and indeed may have um, contributed to the process of ab abolition. Um, history is, as I say, contentious. But the, the really exciting thing, from my point of view, and I chair the Heritage Alliance, as uh, well as the Church's Conservation Trust, and I'm involved in the commission that is looking at the statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College, Oxford, right at the moment. The really exciting thing for me, if I may say so, is that history matters. Uh, well, good title, uh, Policy Exchange, because history isn't and heritage are not just about old stuff that sort of sits around and gets ignored it can ignite debate and interest and excitement. And I think that is a really good news. Um, in fact, I, I am biased in this, although I'm strictly neutral in the debate that we're about to have, um, uh, because I think we should have more statues rather than fewer statues. Uh, I'm a huge believer in statues and their endless fascination about why they were put there, the, the characters were, uh, and how we can... Uh, make them more uh, alive and interesting to current generations. Um, is there a conflation between going on here between slavery and the Colston situation, uh, which was a direct involvement, and wider colonialism? Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'd like to tease that one out, if I may. Um, do we do we actually have a moral right to remove history, which? we ourselves find offensive. I don't know. Um, uh, the Rhodes generation, for example, thought that they were the complete apogee of moral superiority, and they behaved as such. Are we not in danger of aping that kind of, um, at that kind of arrogance? I don't know. Luckily, we have three superb panelists to discuss these matters with you. And they are Sir Laurie Magnus, who's the uh, chair of Historic England, has statutory responsibilities in terms of public spaces and um, uh, heritage structures. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Zaria Masani, who's a very distinguished historian and author. And we have Professor Evelyn Welsh, who is the interim president and principal of King's College London. Um, I can't think of three better people to take whatever flack is about to hit them. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over, um, by the way, I think we wind this up at two o'clock, um, hand, hand over to them for kind of five minutes each, and then it's over to you, and I hope the technology works. Thank you. Um, Laurie Magnus. 
Great. Well, Peter, thank you very much. And um, you've asked a whole lot of questions and given no answers. But the thing you have said, uh, which is great, um, I think, is that uh, history matters. And it really does matter. And, and um, the good news coming out of this debate is that people are actually taking interest in our historic environment and statues and monuments and the rest of it. And that has to be a good thing, because there are quite a lot of them which, in the past, people have uh, simply ignored or not known about. I just want to talk very briefly about the role, first of all, of Historic England. We are an advisor. Uh, we advise uh, the government on what should be listed and what should not be listed. And in that context, I should tell you, there are roughly 400,000 scheduled monuments and listed buildings in this country. The actual number of statues uh, listed in their own right is just about a 1,000 uh, within that 400,000, although there are probably another 2,500 or so which are named in list descriptions for other buildings. Uh, our role is to advise. Um, so as I say, we advise on listing. We then advise on planning applications um, for grade one and grade two star. And in the case of grade two, uh, where an item is being removed. And there are two um, parts of the planning system. There's the sort of what might be called the lay system, where planning applications are made to local authorities, uh, but also the ecclesiastical exemption system, where um, applications are made to the church or uh, relevant uh, place of worship authority. In the case of the Church of England, that's the consistory court. And we advised on all of that. Uh, and we look at, in the case of statues and monuments, and I have to say that to date, we have not yet received a formal planning application in the lay system. Uh, we're aware of three uh, planning applications in the ecclesiastical system. Um, we advise on the historic significance, the historic merit or harm uh, relating to potential removal of a structure, um, its architectural merit and its um, artistic merit. And then it's up to the planning authority or the ecclesiastical uh, authority to make the decision where they will take into account public benefit and other uh, matters. And then um, if uh, the um, Secretary of State in, for Planning, uh, the MHCLG, doesn't like the decision, uh, uh, the Secretary of State can call it in and appoint an inspector. The inspector conducts a report, and uh, the Secretary of State can then take that report from the inspector and decide whether to accept it or not. Now, obviously, that hasn't happened with a statue to date. Um, and uh, a good example, though, of a planning system where um, a, a inspector's report has been um, uh, overruled by Robert Jenrick recently was the plan to build a huge um, skyscraper at Anglia Square in Norwich. Um, most of our work really relates to buildings, obviously, than the monuments. Now, our position on contested heritage, something we developed uh, in 2018, our position is, as a starting point, that monuments and statues should be retained. And that's given the importance of preserving the legacy of our collective past. There is no point censoring, covering up these things and hiding them away. And explain means shedding a light on the facts relating to those historic figures through, first of all, the interpretation panel. Um, uh, but there are lots of other ways of doing it, digital installations and explanations, uh, artwork, or even counter memorials, a very important part of explain. And that's what I think is going to be the subject of really this discussion, is that you cannot uh, exercise moral judgment. You need to engage in facts. And historians um, have, I mean, it is, history is complicated. And the facts relating to a lot of these uh, individuals are complex and difficult sometimes to uncover. Um, for, for me, a concern in the explained debate is what I might call fake news. Um, 
you know, people jumping on uh, to conclusions without actually exploring the facts. So if we take a case in point, the one of the three cases which we are looking at, uh, which has had quite a lot of publicity uh, in relation to uh, the proposed removal of the Grinling Gibbons uh, Memorial to Tobias Rustat at Jesus College, Cambridge, in their chapel, um, where uh, there is a very strong view by the proponents of the planning application um, that um, Rustat was involved through his uh, membership shareholding in the Royal African Company, um, but also an equally strong view um, from uh, those proponents who wish that memorial to stay put in the prominent position it has in the chapel, that uh, Rustat's main source of income, which enabled him to be a magnificent philanthropist, not only in Cambridge but elsewhere, was uh, as an officer uh, under the crown, uh, under Charles II, which, of course, um, anybody who knows about Samuel Pepys, you know, you made a lot of money if you were an officer under the crown in those days, uh, much more. Um, uh, perhaps than uh, what he would have received as a small shareholder in the Royal Africa Company. But those are issues which need to be looked at uh, really, really carefully in the explained. So if I just um, can conclude by saying that we are looking, as I said, at no um, planning applications in the formal um, through the planning system to local authorities. We have three ecclesiastical ones, of which the most prominent is uh, the Rustat uh, issue. And then there is a lot of talk about potential removal around a number of prominent statues. Uh, Peter mentioned Rhodes. Um, there's the City of London. They haven't yet made a formal planning application to remove the statue of William Beckford. Uh, there's the Thomas Guy, which, as you heard earlier, um, was uh, put up as a planning application, but has now been withdrawn, and we're waiting to hear whether they're going to come back again. And of course, it is down to an owner, uh, ultimately, to make a planning application. So I think that's probably enough from me, because otherwise I shall well, dominate the proceeding. No, no, no don't, don't, please don't dominate the proceeding. <laughs> um, <clears throat> that's my job. Um, but thank you very much, Laurie, for, uh, uh, for, for that explanation of the um, uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, planning background to it and and your workload at the moment about this subject. Can we now uh, move to um, Dr. Zaria, who, um, as I said earlier, is, is a very distinguished historian and author with an, a particular interest in this area. Zaria. Um, thank you, Peter. Um, to start with, I just want to make the point, which is fairly obvious, that public spaces should be public. And we need to recognize that standards and values do evolve historically. So do our decisions about whom to honor in public spaces. But what I think makes no sense at all, and what I think you know, we ought to oppose, is attempts to impose today's norms retrospectively on centuries long past. Now, my experience of colonialism was very different from Trevor's. My family rose from very modest origins to the highest echelons of the Raj, uh, participated very um, uh, willingly in the rule by the Raj, thought it was the best government India could have had considering the alternatives. So I think one's norms can differ, and I don't think it, either of us should impose our norms retrospectively. Now, I think there are a few exceptions, like dictators like Saddam or Hitler or Stalin, whose statues have fallen, but as a result, because they were seen as genocidal mass murderers, and it was the toppling of their statues was overwhelmingly popular by uh, among the populations concerned, and they were regarded as mass murderers by the standards of their own time, not just by ours. So I think our tastes do change over the centuries. It's important that those public expressions of it are by democratic consent. So, for example, we need public consultations by local authorities for local spaces, and I would argue by parliament, 
or elected ministers for national spaces, hopefully advised by people like Sir Laurie Magnus. London is a national capital. I don't think it should be left to woke panel members appointed by Sadiq Khan. Uh, it was not what he was elected to do, and there's not a single serious historian on his panel. So I think, as Sir Laurie said, the default position should be to preserve status quo when in doubt, or at the most to add purely factual information to plaques, but to not add derogatory health warnings, but they should be purely factual. Now, coming on to private spaces owned by museums, art galleries, schools, universities, hospitals like Guy's, I think they should be free to make their own internal democratic decisions, provided, and I would argue this is a major ethical point, that this does not affect statues or memorials honoring their donors, because their donors often made huge sacrifices to donate may not have been perfect, may have had faults, but it's not for us to pick over those and keep their funds. So I think central and local government should have the power to intervene. Um, and I think in extremis, if you want to get rid of donors, then I think the donations should be returned or redonated to charity at today's prices. Um, if the donor uh, is considered an evil embarrassment. I don't think it's ethical to keep blood money, uh, which is the source of your donations. I think this applies very much to the road statue. I'm very happy that Peter is on the commission because I think it really needs to consider the ethics. And I hope Historic England will be involved in that too, because it is a great two listed uh, uh, building. Coming on to a couple of specific examples like Havelock Road in Ealing, I have no particular brief for General Havelock. He was a you know um, a very successful general, but Tadwini Mid Guru Nanak Road seems to me again uh, very much playing to a Sikh vote bank in Southall. I don't know if the residents of Ealing as a whole were consulted. And it's rather like naming a road Jesus Christ Road, which you would never dream of doing. Guru Nanak was a, a founder of a religion. He was not a sort of a secular hero. And I'm uh, coming on to the Guy statue. I'm delighted to hear that the planning application has been withdrawn. And I hope if it's resumed, historic England will squash it. And finally, the Melville statue in Edinburgh well, um, it's mercifully been spared removal, but I think there's quite a derogatory health warning that's been attached to it. Melville uh, played a very important role in promoting Scottish interests through the East India Company, through the empire. He made many Scottish fortunes which enriched Scot um, Edinburgh as a city. His monument was heavily subscribed by local donors and ordinary Edinburgh residents. And I think it's sad that what he will now be most remembered for, according to the plaque that's been added, is for marginally delaying, not opposing, but only marginally de delaying anti-slavery legislation, which in principle he was for. So I think it, it, we need to avoid uh, health warnings, which uh, I think this is also something for museums to consider that what you actually put on a plaque should be purely factual and as non-judgmental as possible. So I'd just like to rest it there. Marvellous. Thank you so much, uh, Zaria. That's, uh, that's uh, terrific. Um, well, about to come to Evelyn, but um, a word in my ear says that if you uh, are watching on Zoom and would like to ask a question, please kind of uh, use the raised hand function, or you might even want to raise your hand actually, rather than function, um, in order to raise a question. And we need to crack on quickly. So, Evelyn, um, uh, thank you for joining us. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. And I have a number of slides to put up because I thought it was actually helpful if we saw the statue of Thomas Guy in its original setting. In the um, this is a an engraving from the 19th century. Uh, and if we could go to the next slide, please, Oscar. 
And what you see here is a close-up of the slide uh, of the statue of Thomas Guy, which was produced in 1732, between 1731 and 1734 by Peter Schumacher's. And, and then on these image above, this was the consultant's car park for many, many years. This statue stood unnoticed, uncared for. Historic England never told us to remove the cars. Um, and we finally took it down, redid the courtyard, debated and discussed whether or not to put it back up. Um, and in the end, about two years ago, uh, replaced it in a restored condition. And then uh, over the summer during the protests, we boarded it up for its own protection. Um, if I could go to the next slide, please. Now, my job here is actually, I think, to really demonstrate that history is complicated and that decisions about what stays and what goes are very complex and are not straightforward at all. And also to argue that, that history, our past changes every day. There is no fixed past for us. Every time we throw away a theater ticket, every time we change the way we garden, every time we take down our kitchen, we're changing our own domestic history as well as national and indeed global history. So there is no fixed moment in the past that we have to preserve things as. So the practicalities. Um, the 1997 King's Act brought uh, the Guys and St. Thomas's hospitals and their associated medical schools into the legal ownership of King's College London, but divided much of that space between the hospitals, the hospital charities, and the university. And I should stress here, I'm speaking in a personal capacity, not in an institutional capacity. So in this courtyard, which belongs to King's College London, the base of the statue and the railings around it are the legal responsibility of King's. The statue and the plinth itself belong to Guy's and St. Thomas's charitable trust. While the hospital, although it has an interest and bears Guy's name, has no legal authority over the site. So as Laurie said, it is the responsibility of the owner to make the decision about what happens to the statue. Um, all of these elements individually and as a whole are grade two listed. So we could not remove them without um, planning permission, both locally and now indeed nationally. Um, and a consultation was launched by the charity with our staff, our students, our alumni, but above all patients, doctors, nurses, and the local community to really understand what the views were of the broader community. Back to Zuria's comment about a more democratic approach than just one decision to remove or one decision to retain. And that's still ongoing. And, and I'm not here to speak for the charity. To make things even more complicated, Zuria, what facts would we put on the side of this statue? Um, it was put up by the recently appointed administrators of the new hospital, um, who were given permission by Parliament to spend part of the £200,000 donation, the largest donation ever made in English history, to found the hospital. Lots of complexity behind that, to remember a Guy as a member of the stationer's company. He was also an MP for Tamworth, and he's shown in his stationer's um, civic garb. So, so this is a celebration of an establishment figure, a bookseller, who has taken the wealth that he accumulated through careful long-term investment. And those £200,000 come from the translation of um, debt that he had bought stocks in, so-called Siemens shares, which in 1711 had been translated by forcibly by the government into South Sea Company stock. Now, the South Sea Company, again, we don't have time to get into it, was really a very 
complex organization which bought the so-called Asiento in 1713, which Britain gained through the Treaty of Utrecht. And the Asiento obliged the South Sea Company to ship 4,800 enslaved persons from Africa to the South, um, to South American colonies belonging to Spain. Uh, the assumption that this would create huge wealth and huge increases caused eventually the South Sea bubble, which we don't need to go into. Guy sold his shares in 1720 at the height of the South Sea investment craze and therefore made a huge fortune. But as we've heard, he was only one of many, many individuals who was seeking a long-term investment, in his case, a 5% return. Um, uh, many, many um, men who were looking for safe investments, long-term investments, looked to these joint stock companies to do so. There is no doubt that this money came in part from the slave trade. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Whether or not we try to say, oh, it was only a little bit, um, that doesn't, a little bit or a large bit does not negate the fact that this investment structure in this period was highly dependent on colonial plantation trade and the slave trade. Now, there are 31 presidents of St. Thomas's Hospital between 1561 and 1881 that our um, history students have studied. And of these, 22 were involved with English overseas expansion, and 11 had direct links to the slave trade. But, but there aren't statues erected to them. So we don't discuss their names. We're not concerned about them. Thomas Guy has become symbolic for the way UK finances, that the foundation of the British Empire, if you like, was based on financial speculation on overseas trade, including, but particularly in this case, the slave trade. Now, our students, staff and patients, could choose to go the long way round between London Evelyn, Bridge. Evelyn, I'm very keen that we should have time for um, yes. a Q&A. Yes. So I'm, I'm just concluding now, Peter. Our students have don't always have the choice to go around and away from the statue. So we do need to understand that people can feel quite passionate, and rightly so. And I'll conclude there. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, that was interesting. And we now know more about, um, um, uh, uh, about, about your subject, uh, Guy, than uh, we did before. Now, um, thank you all uh, our panelists and for those interesting contributions let's let's kind of go back let's go to the let's go to whoever's listening whoever's put their hand up i don't know actually it's all being controlled by an unseen hand um hopefully um i will get a message um <laughs> no hands up so i'm going to ask a question i don't know how many people are watching this is anybody there um uh, I've, I've got a question uh, myself, and it's, it, it comes from actually something that Zaria said. Um, uh, what if you, you talked about the removal of statues of Hitler uh, and, and, and um, Saddam and so on, but what if, um, what if the current generation as a whole democratically feels that um, colonialists were genocidal mass murderers, to use your words. Well, I, I think the point I was making was that in the case of people like Hitler, Stalin, Mao, uh, it's their contemporaries who saw them as genocidal mass murderers. It's not us 200 years later. So uh, I, I think you have to judge when we're looking at colonial figures or figures like Rhodes. They could have been racist, they may have had links with the slave trade, but I would maintain that they were very much to be judged by the standards of their own time. Uh, you know, 
slavery, not just transatlantic slave trade, slavery was global, it was universal, it was widely practiced in India. We don't go around to, uh, highlighting Indian slavers and removing their statues. So, uh, you know, the, to just pick on the transatlantic slave trade, go back 200 years and pick on anyone who had a connection, I think makes no sense at all. It's fair enough. I mean, um, Evelyn, do you, do you have a view on that? So, of course, even within the 16th and 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, slavery was contested. There was no automatic assumption that it was a positive feature. And, and we, you're quite right, Zaria. There are, um, there are global problems with unslaved people, indeed, even today. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that we shouldn't be exploring our own heritage and being willing to look at some very complex and, and uncomfortable parts of our past and not just try to say, well, everyone did it. Because of course, if you were a Quaker in the 17th or 18th century, you were adamantly opposed to slavery. If you were a Franciscan or a Dominican <laughs> in Spain, in Spanish Spain, you were also very, very antagonistic to attempts to enslave the indigenous populations there. So there were multiple voices in our historical past, and it was as contested then as it is now. That's, that's thank you very much. I, I've got a question from Ni Nigel Bigger, who, um, if Nigel, you could explain um, where you're coming from. I think you've written on this subject actually quite extensively, uh, stuff I enjoyed. So can we go to Nigel Bigger? I'm here. I, I can't. I can't see myself. Can you see me? Um, not at the moment, but we can hear you, which is the important hear, thing. Fine, fine. If you can hear me. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to say I, I I agree with almost everything that's been said. Um, I would uh, reinforce the point that um, when you asked Peter what false description of. British colonialism as a whole, so that there's an historical point to be made. And my observation is that much of the history that is supposed to support claims for the dismantling of roads, etc., is simply bad history. So that, 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 that's one point. Another point would be um, that um, a single statue can mean many different things. Uh, so when someone walks past a statue of, of uh, someone who perhaps um, um, profited from slavery, then it means to them, this is a slaver being celebrated. But in fact, the statue probably wasn't erected to celebrate slavery. It was erected to celebrate philanthropy. Uh, so statues mean different things. To different... If I'm a student or iconoclast, or even better, if I am the, um, the head of a, an Oxford college or of a museum or of some institution, and I'm under pressure, uh, to, to yield to um, um, passionate um, uh, feelings about a certain piece of statuary, what would your immediate advice to me be? Uh, Laurie. I, well, my immediate advice to you um, would be, uh, I mean, assuming that you are the owner of the statue, um, would be to um, seek to uh, uh, explain it um, and explain the background of the history. I, I, I do believe, um, you know, I mean, there, there may be sometimes reasons for removing a statue, which may be because of you know, it, it's going to move, look better in a, in, a, in a different place or something like that, or somebody wants to build a, a new um, recreation facility or something, and it's it's in the way. But um, assuming that the reason is to um, the reason for moving it or the request to move it is because of people don't like uh, the history of the person represented. I think you know that is um, uh, always almost invariably um, covering up history and covering up our collective past. Um, and these things have to be explained. And there are lots of ways to explain them. Um, you know, it, it, it's not just the plaque, and, and as um, 
all the speakers of this panel, I think, have said, you know, it needs to be factual if you if you are whatever you write on the plug. But there's the digital interpretation. I mean, you know, to be able to flash a QR code at um, uh, and and get all the information about the person without moral judgment, you know, and uh, many of these acts, as, as Evelyn has said, you know, look pretty awful in, in by contemporary standards. Um, you know, but and and but we should shine a light on it, not uh, cover it up and hide it. Um, and people need to recognise these, as, as um, has been said. You know, these individuals were in their time when these statues were um, erected, uh, revered by um, the people who 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 put the statues up to them. And, and one, we should. Laurie, uh, Laurie, thanks. But I, we've had another question actually to do with this, which is. That you know, explain what uh, is the question? Is a statue the best place to explain anything? Couldn't it be better done by some other means? Well, uh, Peter, I, I've said you know QR code. Um, you know that will lead um, person looking at the statue to a um, a whole sort of bibliography and of. of um, uh, reference, historic reference, because a lot of these people are very, very complicated, as, as has been said, you know, there's big, you know, a lot, lot of stories, a lot of research still going on. Um, explain is, um, is not um, a sort of standard, you know, two paragraphs description. Um, it probably is much more than that, because these, you know, history is, is, is complex. So uh, a digital explanation, it could be a sort of artistic installation that might help. Um, could be even a counter memorial, just to sort of go to the, um, you know, the one other um, point. I mean, you know, I mean, the one statue which um, I think you mentioned, which has been removed um, illegally, of course, is the Colston uh, statue, which was, um, and you know, whether uh, if that was put back with a statue next to it, maybe. Um, you know, in in where on next to its pedestal um, of the the figure there was a, there was a twenty four hour um, uh, you know, statue put up alongside that of one of the demonstrators who um, pulled it down. Um, that might be a very good way of interpreting it. I've, I've, I've already said I'm, I'm personally in favour of more statues, so I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that. I thought it was a very good piece, actually. Um, we've got a question from Holly Trusted. Holly Trusted? She's not there. Okay. Um, now, look, I hope there's somebody listening who disagrees with all of this, because otherwise it's kind of it's looking a bit like kind of we're all in the same place. And we know that um, not everybody is in the same place on this stuff. So I'd, I'd love to hear from somebody who actually takes a very different view, because if there weren't people who took a different view, we wouldn't be having the conversation in the first place. Peter, perhaps I could come in briefly and just remind yeah. Um, us all that, of course, Britain, uh, England in particular, was a great place of iconoclasm after 1530. An awful lot of statues were torn down, stained glass broken, Virgin Mary's um, uh, removed. So the kind of revolutionary history of breaking, removing, destruction of the physical, powerful remains of Catholicism was actually built into the fabric of, of, of literally the church fabric. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> taking, th taking things away can make history as well as putting them up. Tragic, that. I, ju I just want to say, as, as a non-Christian atheist, I think the iconoclasm of the Reformation was horrendous and a crime against art and humanism. I don't think taking down statues of Virgin Mary was something we should be emulating. And I just think the norm should be, I think as Sir Laurie suggested, that it, when in doubt the status quo should continue, there may be exceptions. And I would distinguish between 
people who had links with slavery and mass murderers, genocidal mass murderers like Hitler or Stalin. I don't think Hitler or Stalin should be compared or with someone like John Guy or even Cecil Rhodes. So I think a, a lot of these things is a matter of degree and we need to keep our sense of proportion. So I don't think uh, connections with slavery are anything like genocidal mass murder. Maria, can I, I, I mean, I said I'd be neutral in this, but I so vehemently agree with you that I can't be neutral on what you've just said. Um, it's a bit like blowing up statues of Buddha if you're a Taliban member. It's, I mean, the whole uh, Reformation thing was just uh, shocking. Um, in that, can I ask, can um, I ask Gloria a question? Um, which well, we've got is... a question coming in from Kenneth We've got a question coming in from, from Hannah Shimko, if we may. And Hannah, if you can state your um, uh, organisation, that would be helpful. Yeah, so I'm Hannah Shimko, I'm head of policy at the Heritage Alliance. Um, I was just interested in, in what Peter had said about more statues than none and, and a few of the comments on the side on public space. You know, are we thinking about how we erect statues in the future, how those decisions are made about statues in the future and how we kind of control or, or how we, we plan, I suppose, uh, public spaces in terms of... Oh, sorry, um, uh, who'd like to answer that? Evelyn. Thank you. Um, and, and that's a really important one, is who decides who goes where, um, what is it that we decide to honour in the future. I'm actually really very positive about the idea of having contemporary responses to mm. our historical past. Um, but do we, do we vote? as to who we honour today. We've certainly seen with the Mary Wilsoncroft statue that not everyone is appreciative of the, the, the visual means by which she's been honoured. So uh, even, even the contemporary use of public space and what's honoured and who's honoured is something that um, actually I'm glad to see that people are passionate about. And the question I'd really had for Laurie was something very similar which is if we take nothing down from the past, and indeed if from the 18th century onwards, nothing had ever been removed, changed, etc., what space would we have left for new memorials? How crowded can we allow our public spaces to be? Um, I, uh, uh, excellent. I, I don't know whether you've got a statue of John Keats at Guy's, but um, can I recommend that? We do. Okay, good. Um, uh, it's a lovely I'm, statue. Excellent. I'm sorry I haven't seen it. Uh, uh, luckily, I haven't seen it because I haven't had to go to Guy's recently. But anyway, um, we've got a question coming in from um, Afwa. Afwa, we have a question from you. If you could say... Uh, if, if you've got an organisation who you're representing. Hi, um, I'm I'm Afwa. I'm just a student, and I want to. Um, I've just been attending the talks today. They've been really interesting. But I wanted to ask Evelyn. Um, although there's already sort of been a discourse in the chat about it, um, about the actual relevance of these multiple voices that were anti-slavery in the time of Thomas Guy. Um, are those multiple vo voices actually reflected in the statues that we have? I don't think so. And is opposition to slavery from Spain actually relevant? And does that make it any better that we have colonial statues that exist in the here and now? How do these um, things, or how does opposition in Spain, or Quakers, who we know are a minority even within Christianity, which now is also a minority religion, how do they contribute to policy, policy decisions, democratic society, that it's not um, the, the views of, Span of Spanish people and Quakers in the 17th century does not reflect the views of the people right now and therefore should have no influence, in my opinion, on policy. London is small. There's only so many statues we can have. Surely statues should be re reflective of the heroes of the generations that are to come, not of, I guess, um, capitalists who managed to make a lot of money from slavery especially since people make money in more interesting ways. Are we going to have a statue of Lord Sugar next, or um, is he not as noble because it didn't happen in the 17th century? I have to say the Spanish continued slavery long after the British abolished it, and the British Navy did a lot to stop Spanish slavery. 
Wasn't that a question to Evelyn? It, it, it was. And Alpha, thank you. And you've raised a number of really important issues. The first, and I apologise if you've misunderstood me, um, I wasn't in any way arguing that uh, Franciscan friars in 1520 Peru um, view should be thought about today. I was simply pointing out that there were no single views about enslavement and enslaved peoples in the historical past. So to simply say that in the past, the past is the past and that there was one view and we should just accept it. I'm arguing that there were contest contestations in those periods themselves. And people had choices to make about their views on enslavement. London is small um, and people who invest and decide to celebrate something have to get permission to put things up in public spaces. So there are, um, you know, there's, there's nothing to stop anyone from honoring Lord Sugar within his own home or having a bust, but I would imagine Laurie would have something to say if we tried to put up a major bronze monument to him in a grade two listed environment. And, and it is very much, uh, and I agree with Peter here, that actually thinking forward as well as protecting the past is the right way to do it. But Laurie, perhaps you'd like to say something about how we actually get that future focus as well as protecting the past through historical influence. Can we come to, to you, Laurie, on that uh, in a moment? Because we've just got another question in. I think it's the last question. And then um, if people want to just sort of add their final comments, that would be great. Uh, a question from just, uh, Justin Reich. And Justin, if you could say where you're from, that would be helpful. Hi. Hello. Oh. Okay. Let's uh, let's then move on because um, well, I'm very. Hello. Um, yeah. No, no Matt, uh, Laurie. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, no, you're absolutely right, Evelyn. I mean, I I think um, you know. I mean, of course, uh, statues. Generally, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on uh, you know w w what has led to um, statues being uh, put up, but in general, I think it is the case that they have been uh, put up through um, subscription, um, you know, public subscription, uh, rather than by um, you know, government, uh, central government. Um, but you know, obviously, there will be a variety of ways in which statues are put up. Um, I actually think there is um, still a lot of space. I mean, people still say there's space available in Parliament Square. The fourth plinth, of course, um, is vacant, uh, notoriously vacant. And um, you know, there are um, opportunities and, and lots of spaces in uh, new towns across the country. But I think actually it's worth not just focusing only on statues. I think it's also worth looking at memorials and particularly plaques. I'm a trustee of English Heritage, which is responsible for the blue plaque scheme in London. Um, you know, we now have something of the order of about a thousand plaques across London, and we're trying to uh, put up more plaques um, at around 12 a year, uh, commemorating distinguished people um, and um, on commemorating them on the places where they lived. And I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there. It doesn't have to be statues. Um, but in order to accelerate the rate for English heritage, this is a plug coming, um, we need to um, raise more money for English heritage. It's a great organization. I hope everybody's a member. Um, but uh, 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 but I, think, I think there are, you know, I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity. And, and, you know, obviously, sometimes people will have to have planning permission uh, if, it's, if it's a large statue or something, but, um, you know, I, uh, Historic England is um, open, you know, to uh, uh, constructive arguments and, uh, you know, to try to help, particularly if it's um, something that will improve 
the look of the landscape and improve okay. people's understanding of history. I think we've got just time for one more quick question. Um, but you've just brought up the fourth plinth, which brings us back neatly to the beginning, because, of course, one of the statues in Trafalgar Square is that, is that of none other than Sir Henry Havelock that we uh, talked about at the beginning of this. But I've got a question from Alka. Alka, if you can say where you're from. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, great. Okay, so um, I'm from Don't Divide Us. Um, I, the question I want to put really to, to all of you is, is how, to what extent you think the motor of today's controversies around historical statues are actually have anything to do with history at all, because I think um, they, often what um, the people who want to um, take statues down, they object to a particular attitudes and particular values especially anything that, that smacks of, you know, what they see as um, a, a kind of patriotic or pride or anything celebratory that for them um, is read as a kind of threat, one, sort of one step down from being an outright fascist. So it seems to me there's a kind of question of moral authority, if you like, that's being contested here that, that I think doesn't really have that much to do with history itself. Um, uh, uh, I wish you'd asked that question uh, about 50 minutes ago, because it's a really, really interesting question, and we now have no minutes left. But um, who'd like, uh, I think, I think that uh, Zaria should answer that one. Um, yes, I, I think it's, it's quite right, as Alka says, that this uh, is really a discussion which isn't so much about history, but is hijacked by people who want to make a moral or political point. Uh, one example I'd like to give you, which uh, I, I think is absolutely outrageous, is that there is a memorial to Sir William Jones in the chapel of University College, Oxford. Um, it shows Sir William Jones, who was a great Sanskritist, who rediscovered India's classical heritage, um, rediscovered Sanskrit as, as a, a classical language, He's shown sitting at a desk with two Indian Brahmin scribes who were sitting on the floor next to him. And this is being seen as him subjugating these two Brahmins. What it completely ignores is that most Indians of that generation and still prefer to sit on floors and actually do sit on the floor for banquets, for religious occasions, etc. So it would be absolutely normal for these two Brahmins to be squatting beside him rather than sitting at a desk which would be totally outlandish for them. So he was not patronizing them, he was not subjugating them, he was actually taking notes from their wisdom and rediscovering their heritage. So the idea that this memorial should be taken down because some Indian tourists saw it and thought it was disrespectful is just totally outrageous, but it's very much a sign of the times. That's uh, very good. Now, um, look, we've, we've, I'm told we've got another uh, possible three minutes. Let's go. If you've got final, thank you, Alka, very much indeed for a question which we could have discussed for the entire hour, in my view. Um, let's, uh, any final comments from the panel? And I'm going to Evelyn first. Thank you. I think the point that Zaria made, which is we often project our, you know, our feelings, our emotions, onto inanimate objects is very important. And that's why statues in the public space for what we collect do make people feel very appropriately passionate. And we do need to hear the voices of those who feel offended by what we honor in the past, as well as those who feel that these are neutral, as well as those who feel that they should be celebrated. And it's only by listening to that debate and understanding what lies behind that, that we can actually, to Afwa's point, look forward to a future that is more equitable and just. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Laurie. Um, I was going to I agree with Evelyn, and um, Alka makes a really, really good point. Um, you know, I talked earlier about fake news. Um, you know, historical inquiry is not simple, and it's certainly not comfortable. 
Um, and certainly I have found, and my colleagues at Historic England have found, that we've been at the end of a lot of uh, abuse from both sides of the argument, you know, both uh, for our uh, policy of uh, retain, but also our policy of explain. You know, some people have said, explain, you know, you're just um, uh, you know, bowing to, um, to uh, you know, those who, who want to take all the, um, these things down. Um, I, it is, it is uh, in some sense, I sort of feel that since we're upsetting both sides of the argument, we must be doing something right. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, as I said at the beginning, I think the good news about this, the good news about what Policy Exchange is doing, is raising the public awareness of um, you know, history, and that's great. So Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Uh, to all our panellists and to everyone who's been... Uh, 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 Peter, can I just make one quick point, which I think we haven't mentioned, but which will come up with the Culture Secretary in the afternoon, which is the role of the government. And I just want to say that I think it's very, uh, very positive that the government is going to play some role in this. And I hope the Culture Secretary will intervene on well, controversial issues we'll, like the road statute, we, we will, we will, uh, we will see. Uh, and 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 it's marvellous that uh, he's able to give time to contribute to this. Particularly, actually, and this is a bit of context, I think that, you know, actually, most people in the heritage sector at the moment are really worried about continuing to survive at all. And some people will think that it's a bit odd that so much time, energy, emotional uh, effort, and political uh, enthusiasm is being applied to uh, things um, that most people ignored for most of the time, for most of their lives. Um, so let's remember that actually, like every other sector in the UK, heritage has got serious difficulties at the moment. Um, but thank you all. We've, I think, concluded. Um, it's sad not to have heard um, from anyone who thinks that that actually te tearing down statues is a good idea. I'd love to have heard their point of view, um, but we haven't. Um, we've concluded that um, uh, history and statues and heritage are complex things, um, that explanation is not necessarily easy, um, uh, that it's all fascinating and very current and alive. And that is the good bit. So thank you all so much. Thanks to all who watched and contributed. And I am told to remind you that at 2.15, uh, this will go back uh, into action and we'll start with a session chaired by Nicholas Coleridge, I think, uh, about museums and galleries. And subsequently, the Secretary of State is due to make a manifestation. So thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye for now. Thank you.
Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Nicholas Coleridge and I'm chairing this Museums and Galleries panel. And I will shortly be introducing to you our exceptionally distinguished panelists. As we all know, museums and galleries are challenged as never before for movements advocating decolonization or at very least revision in their approach in the presentation of historical objects. Although the debate, debate has been juntering on for some time, I think it gathered and intensified in May 2020, following the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which greatly increased mute, uh, media scrutiny and um, interest, and indeed increased the scrutiny coming from the Department of Culture, from central government, and from the Secretary of State. How should museums and galleries respond um, to and remain representative of the public that we serve? What is actually happening on the ground? Is government guidance fit for purpose from the point of view of museum boards and of professional staff? How should central government respond? And how, if at all, should museums and galleries choose their advisors who reinterpret the collections and who has oversight of this, who decides on the courses of action. These are the big questions that we will be wrestling with um, over the next hour. I would like to applaud the Policy Exchange um, for hosting this panel, and I commend its History Matters newsletter, which is very relevant. Please, during the debate, for those watching on Zoom, use the raise hands feature. And if you have if you have a question, and I'm asked to remind you that if invited to give your question, please give your name and the organization that you work for. Let me introduce the very distinguished panel alphabetically. So Ian Blatchford has been the director and chief executive of the Science Museum Group. Uh, for 10 years since 2010. Um, he was previously the deputy director of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, he was at the Arts Council, having started Life in the City. He was the director of finance at the Royal Academy of Arts, uh, and he is currently chairman of the National Museum Directors Council. We have Dr. Laura Breakoven, who is, of course, director of the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, where she is also associated with the School of Anthropology and in Museum Ethno Ethnography in that city. He previously led the curatorial department of the um, National Museum of World Cultures and was a lecturer in archaeology, museum studies, and indigenous heritage at Leiden University. She is a member of the Women's Leaders in Museum um, Network and co-chair of the Oxford and Colonialism Network, as well as being a founding member of WEAB, which is, of course, the Association of Mayanists. We come to Sharon Hill, who is director of the UK Museums Association. Um, that campaigns to promote the values of museums to society. Um, Sharon has written extensively about museums and cultural heritage and contributed chapters to the Museum and Public Value book and also um, to museum activism. Sharon is also chair of the Museum of Homelessness, um, the Community Driven Social Justice Museum in London. Dr. Samir Shah is the chair of the Jeffrey Museum of the Home and also chief executive and creative director of Juniper TV, the independent television and radio company. Samir finds himself rather at the heart of the, the decolonization debate as chair of the Jeffrey, following focus on the fact that um, the founder of the museum, Sir Robert Jeffrey, was peripherally associated with the slave trade, as well as being a distinguished merchant, philanthropist, and Lord Mayor of London. I would like 
start by asking each of the four panelists in turn to say briefly where they think we are now in this great contested history debate. Is the debate abating or is it gathering steam? Samir, can I start by asking you? Uh, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so I don't know if you heard the uh, Peter Ainsworth session earlier where he complained there was full agreement around the table. I suspect you won't get that in this one. Um, uh, you also asked us to be courteous. There's no problem with that, Nicholas, but you also asked us to be witty. And I think, oh, I don't know, I've run out of my joke book here. But let me begin by uh, making three points. The first, which would be the most, I, I don't wish to rehearse the issues surrounding the Museum of the Home. I want to learn lessons from it and let's discuss that. Uh, the, the first one is what I would call the conditionality of funding. This alludes to the now infamous letter from the Secretary of State. Um, now, he wrote, uh, and he wrote to me as well, and he said, I, as a DCMS sponsored museum, I would expect your approach to issues of contested history to be consistent with the position which you meant, by which you meant uh, retain and explain. Uh, now I was quite relaxed about that letter, uh, uh, although obviously others weren't. Uh, I was relaxed because to me, conditionality is nothing new. Uh, even as we speak, uh, I'm a member of the Cultural Recovery Board where we are handing out quite a lot of money to lots of organizations, private and uh, public, and we attach a lot of conditions to how that money uh, should be spent. Uh, the Arts Council itself has uh, written expecting their organizations. Let me read it to them, to you. He said, the Arts Council says, um, our funded organizations are expected to show how they contribute to the case for diversity through the work they produce, present, and collect. So that's actually something more interventionist in terms of curatorial matters. But I notice that both the Arts Council and the Secretary of State use the verb expect. And so I'm perfectly relaxed. I think the Arts Council have an absolute right to say that because they're funded organizations. And I think any funded organization should expect conditionality through those funds. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the regulatory framework. I think we need to strengthen, in my, as a result of my experience, the regulatory framework. I think this is, this is, in a way, the best way to safeguard both curatorial independence and to ensure a duty of impartiality. Obviously, this only applies to public service, publicly funded organization. My comparison here is my previous organization, the BBC, which has in the form of editorial guidelines, an attempt to preserve editorial independence and the duty of impartiality, which obtains, and this is critical, whichever government is in power. It really should be, these guidelines should be independent of the politics of government in power. And the final point I'd like to make, and this really comes from the heart because of the experience I had at the Museum of the Home, I would very much wish for a DCMS protocol to be established for handling controversial issues. Such a protocol, again, should safeguard curatorial independence and be independent of any party in power. For example, it needs to set out clearly what is meant by a cons public consultation in advance of any decision. You know, what is the right way to carry this out? How does a def museum define the public? Who carries out the consultation? Should it be a professional organization that does this, like Ipsos Mori? They have the expertise to sample the public in, way that, in ways that make the, the results more representative. They know how to face questions that are neutral. I mean, this still won't be a mandate, but a board would feel reassured that the consultation has been rigorously and properly carried out. There are lots of other factors we could go into, which I think should a pro such a protocol should, have, should, uh, should be made. Um, Okay, I'll stop there, um, and I'll let other people talk. Well, thank you, Samir. I think that was a rather good teeing up of the debate, but I want to move immediately to Laura. Um, I feel that the Pitt Rivers has always been rather in the middle of this debate, and I would love to know how you and your associates there are feeling about it, and whether you think you're making the headway you want, or whether you're resenting the slight pushback that there might be in the air at the moment. Riff it please. 
thank you. Thank you for um, for in having me up on the panel. And I, I agree that we might not have a sort of a, a, a difficulty in finding diversity of views on this panel. Because I'm really excited about this moment because at no time in recent history has the discipline of history been more important. And it's great to see that so many people are involved in thinking about it. And as I'm sure we will all know, history is obviously written by individuals. For a very long time, only certain kinds of people were deemed trustworthy of writing that history. And only certain sources were deemed to be historical. And in my own field of expertise, it panned out that looking at things through only one lens brought us a very narrow version of history and one that wasn't very accurate. And until two decades ago, the history of the conquest of the Americas was written only through the lens of European sources, uh, so Spanish language and English language and Dutch language sources. Once we started, however, to actually dive into sources written in Maya, in Nahuatl, in Mixtec, in Chocho, including indigenous historical sources, meant that we had to entirely rewrite what actually happened as part of the conquest of the Americas. And so to continue to tell history, archaeology, or anthropology through 19th or 20th century lenses only would be to stifle our disciplines. We would not work um, towards building knowledge, but we'd, ob we'd obstruct the processes that lead to it. And for a museum like the Pitt Rivers Museum, to not do the work of decoloniality would be like wanting to represent developments in science without talking about more recent advances such as nanoscience or quantum theory or pretending that research into DNA doesn't exist and doesn't matter because it contradicts our earlier understanding of the world. And so to ignore that the work of decoloniality is necessary in the sciences, in museums and in heritage, heritage is to not understand, I think, how colonial thinking and how colonial curriculums limit us in our thinking. So colonial systems of thinking were built on the idea that knowledge is produced only in certain ways and only in certain places. And that meaning can only be attributed by some and not others. So to convince ourselves of that was part of a system that had convinced itself that only some people and some places produce knowledge. knowledge. For example, that males were those that were educated enough to be given the right to speak. And elites were those who were to teach us and that certain ways of being, of living, of loving were allowed, while others were not. But this limited the amount of voices that were allowed to tell histories. Um, it limited the sort of stories that were told and it limits deeper understanding of society. It also limits the sort of audiences to who those stories matter. So it is why I am excited about this moment, because with so many more people involved in the conversation about history and so many more sources being considered, history is starting to become more relevant to its potential audiences. Laura, that's very helpful. Before I introduce Sharon, may I just insert one very quick question of my own? The Pitt Rivers has always been a, a very favorite museum of mine. When you and Dan Hicks and others come in and you stroll around as a pair looking at it as it is now. Do you wish it were very different in the way in what it represents and in what its labeling does and in what is in there? As director, how are you feeling as you look at the museum as it's presently configured? So if you're asking me, do I want to rip apart the Pitt Rivers Museum and the parts that people love about the museum? No, not at all. I don't think any of us are doing that. But I think what you asked also was, you know, um, what should we as museums be asking ourselves? And I think what we are asking is how do we continue to challenge our publics to imagine better futures together? So rather than serving one or the other part of the public, how might we serve all of our public? So in that sense, I think what we really are doing, and I know that lots of people sort of feel um, quite passionate and emotional about this. So when at the Pitt Rivers Museum, there were certain objects that we removed uh, from display, we um, largely, our audiences were very pleased and that, you know, the, we are doing an analysis of the reactions of our audience and they were 93% po uh, uh, positive. But what we notice that some people, and they feel very passionately angry and emotional about this, seem to view the removal of certain objects or the insertion of new 
uh, ways of telling the story as a sort of an idea of um, a loss. Well, actually, what we're trying to show is that we aren't losing anything, but we're creating space for more expansive story. Brilliant. Deftly that put. is at the heart of decolonization. I'm going to move on to Sharon. Sharon, your organization, your association, has a very wide membership. How are you feeling at the heart of that, about this debate and where it's going? Yes, thanks, Nicholas. Um, as you say, we've got a, a, a wide membership. We're the oldest and one of the largest museums association in the world, and we represent mm. the people who work in and with museums and many institutions of all scale and size across the UK. And we do have a long track record of supporting work with collections. We div deliver over a million pounds a year in partnership with the Esme Fairburn Foundation and others to support collections work. And, and we also hold the Code of Ethics for Museums and support the work of the Ethics Committee. So where we stand is we consider work around rethinking and re-evaluating our collections, including decolonizing work, to be ethically the right thing to do. Because research and interpretation is just a normal part of the work in museums. It happens on a day-to-day -day basis across every type of collection. It's what curators, academics, learning and engagement staff do. And they very often do it in consultation with their communities. So we established the Decolonization Guidance Working Group at the request of our Ethics Committee and in response to the recommendations in our Empowering Collections report that was published in 2019. And I would say for that report, we consulted over a thousand people across the sector, funders and stakeholders about the future of collections. And, and our overarching goal is to bring collections closer to people and communities. In terms of today's discussion... Can I just pick you up on that? What does it mean, closer to people and communities? Just in a nutshell, what does that mean? So it, it means people and communities being involved in the research, in the interpretation, in participating in the life of the museum and making sure that their stories are told. So in terms of today's discussion, you know, we have seen that collections are increasingly being questioned by different groups in society. Many museums have sought to play a positive role in these discussions. We can't ignore the discussions that are taking place outside our walls. But we also know there's a lack of information about how to approach these issues, including decolonization, which is why we've set up the group, which is why we want to provide guidance. But I think, you know, it, this work is complex. It's not straightforward. It has to be based on research, including provenance research and collaborative research with communities, including source communities. And we need the skills and funding to be able to do it. And, and I don't think that this should be viewed as a binary discussion. Decolonization is not simply the relocation of a statue or an object. It's a long-term process that is seeking to recognize the legacy of empire and slavery in museums. It's about broadening and deepening our understanding. And, and that term was used right at the beginning in the introduction. Understood. Deep and deep well put. Thank understanding. You. I'm going to so if I could just, Nicholas, because, yeah. sorry. If I, if I could just give you some examples, yes. because I think not everybody is familiar. Be time because I can see Ian is bursting over to come in and tell us stuff. Yeah, yeah, so examples of the work so that people can visualise what's happening. National Museums Liverpool working with communities, artists, creatives, staff and academics uh. to rethink and redisplay the World Cultures Gallery. National Museum Wales working with a, a panel a youth advisory panel. And, and by the way, I think we shouldn't just write off young people. Young people have a stake and an interest in history um, to, to reinterpret the portrait of the Lieutenant General Thomas Pigson. And in Scotland, an, an expert group led by Sir Jeff Palmer doing a national consultation about, in collaboration with museums in Scotland, to establish public and expert perspectives. We think this is the kind of work that museums should be doing. We're really excited that it's happening, and we think it will lead to, lead to more interest and more engagement with history and with museums. Thank you, Sharon. Ian, well, where, where, where are you coming from at the moment in your organisation, and you personally? 
Well, um, first of all, I suppose the question is, what hat am I wearing? I'm you know, the director of the Science Museum, but also chairman of the National Museums, and I'm mainly talking as director of the Science Museum, but aware of what other colleagues in the profession are thinking. You started with a question, which is, is the debate, is the debate abating? I would say it's becoming more and more warped. And the reason I say that is my curators have watched with transfixed horror at the online debate about my unbelievably reasonable article in The Telegraph. Mm. Apparently, my fellow panellists need to know that I am both a Tory scumbag and a vile Marxist. Apparently, I'm both, apparently, by trying to suggest that actually museums offer independence. But I think my real job title, which I joke with some of my colleagues, is I am Her Majesty's representative to the people of Middle England. And there's a very important point here, which is quite often forgotten, which is that our visitors, and remember that the 80 million people a year go to the members of NMDC, almost 6 million to my own museum, the public is vastly more intelligent on all of this. So at the minister's event, Hilary McGrady said something which really resonated with me. So the narrative in the press is that a group of woke liberals have hijacked the National Trust. What is less understood is that hundreds of perfectly normal fellow citizens, um, not from any campaigning group, are asking reasonable questions. So, for example, in our museum in Manchester, we have one of the greatest collections in the world on the history of the textile industry. And we're very proud of the fact it also tells the story of white working men and women and the history of labour. But many members of the public, not museum professionals or liberals, write letters saying it is a little bit odd that you say nothing about slavery, OK? So in the middle of this heat that's going on. Just normal citizens, normal visitors are saying, look, we don't have any campaigning issue here. We just sense instinctively that it's a little bit peculiar. And if you look at the public data, it's mm -hmm. absolutely astonishing that the public do not want to tear down statues, but they do believe in greater diversity. And Middle England, the majority of Middle England, would like more stories about slavery because they understand its history, OK? Now, I think one of the other things that is being misunderstood in this debate is that we as a profession do give the impression by the way we talk that we're only focusing our collection development on certain minorities. This is completely untrue. I mean, if you look at the museum developments in recent years, 20 years ago was the story of great men. Then it became just about the story of the occasional women. Now it's also the story of the overwhelming majority of these people, white working class people, OK? So this, this, this is a huge part of our work which is not being understood. Where, though, I think I disagree, or there's a lot of common practice between some of the panel, I do think that if we're intellectually rigorous, we might ask ourselves whether some of the terminology on the left and the right does create problems. So personally, I do have a problem with the phrase decolonization, because actually it sends a message to people that actually misleads people to a lot of actually very benign, sensible scholarship going on that is about my abiding mantra, which is good history is about adding to the record. Even recently, David Osugo at an event at the British Library said, look, all the minorities are asking, we're not asking for special treatment. We're just asking that our stories might join the historical record, OK? But I also think, and this is where I will speak for all the national museums, at our meeting last week, we all agreed that we loathe the phrase contested heritage. What mm -hmm. is contested here? I think if we can do some kind of grand deal here, think about some of the academic language used, but also my key message is can we please talk about the thing that the British people understand, which is shared heritage. Contested is negative, corrosive, and actually going to lead us into a terrible cul-de-sac if we're not careful. Ian, thank you very much indeed. I've been asked, encouraged to remind viewers that if you want to ask a question, you should raise your electronic hand where it's being monitored very cleverly by the policy exchange without us even knowing. I want to ask the panel about the sub about their feelings about retain and explain as the policy under which on the whole we're being encouraged to work at the moment. Isn't the key 
to the difficulty of retain and explain what one is explaining. I mean, isn't this the heart of the matter? Um, I give as an example, if one takes the four characters who we've read so much about in the last year, Edward Colston, um, Thomas Rustad, the Hans Sloan, and Sir Robert Jeffrey, they seem to me, the more I've read about them, to be very, very complex people, because they're, they were far more generous, all four of them, far more generous as philanthropists than almost anybody I know out of everyone I've ever met. I can hardly think of anybody living today who gave more money to almshouses, built more churches, built more schools, gave more away. And yet, um, they were also involved in, in the um, slave trade, which to our modern way of thinking seems something that we can't imagine anybody countenancing. And yet, there were these two sides to their characters. How are we going to going, going forward, how are we going to be able to describe in the quite short spaces that we mostly have on our labels, um, the characters of these great, um, these great donors to our museum? Laura, what do you think? So I think that um, what we need to think about is to really think about what labels actually mean and how do they talk to people and how can we actually expand that in our museum. So instead of trying to rewrite the history of these great sort of white donors, why don't we think about you know, sort of other ways of labeling, labels that actually speak to people through contemporary art, that speak to people beyond just words written on you know, a sheet of paper or a, a, a piece of plastic or whatever we want to. Uh, so I think that we can go much further than, than, than you know, sort of just thinking about um, a statue and, and, and relabeling it. I think part of the statues that we are t talking about is that they're in the public domain, right? So that has to do with how do people recognize themselves in those people being celebrated? And I think that is one of the questions that came up at the former panel. I think the other thing that you have asked us is what you know, role government can play in all of this. And I think that is an important question for us to maybe, given that this is a you know, policy uh, exchange meeting, that I do hope that government trusts its people and also including its academics and its um, professionals. And I think that's not always how it feels right now. Just going back to what Ian was saying about the words that we use and how those matter. Mm -hmm. on all sides. And I don't like to think about this as something that is sort of this dichotomy where there's the left and the right and we're fighting with each other. I mean, there's been so such deep divisions have been created by algorithms, by fake news, by governments. And one would hope that our focus would be by bridging divisions rather than really widening those so, so that government would need to defend the freedom to research, to tell those histories in all their complexity of individuals, of you know, people of um, activities, of historical facts, and in all their nuance, but also being careful not to confuse the sort of nationalist pride with historical evidence. And I think that is really important to sort of not try and conflate those things, because that's not helpful at all. And then I've been a little bit troubled by some of the use of the word um, woke, and I've been, you know, lots of things have been thrown at me. And I, you know, I know that my daughter, who's 16, sort of, when in one of the newspapers, you know, I was being told that I should resign, and I don't know what else, and as sort of depicted as this Trojan horse that was brought in by Oxford. Oh, we have this person here which we can't control, which is not at all what actually has happened. You know, there's a very conscious work that is happening in the whole of the museum field where we are rethinking constantly. So this is not something of today, much like, you know, I, so I, I can see how decoloniality is a work that, work that apparently causes, causes confusion. People Laura, are thinking, thank you. I think that's a very, very good point. Sharon, where do you stand on retaining and explaining? Is that what you want to do? So, so two things. On decolonization as, as a word, I agree with Ian, it's problematic, but it's the word we've got and that's the word that we're working with at the moment. If we can come up with better words, absolutely, let's find them and let's use them and let's use them to describe the amazing work that's taking place in our museums to, to rethink and to reinterpret collections. I would say as far as labels go, Nicholas, then it's not just labels that are interpretation. There's hundreds of different ways of interpreting our objects and the stories that are held within those objects. 
And on the question of government policy, the, the hesitation I have is, I don't have a problem with explain because museums are really great at explaining things, complex ideas, the kind of complex ideas and history that's held in Laura's museum and, and Ian's museum, that museums are brilliant spaces for that. I have a bit of a problem with a policy that starts from a position of retain, because what does that actually mean? Does that mean we retain every object in every position that it is in now in every museum? So I just think it's sort of starting from a very fixed position, which is not what museums are. Museums are really fluid, creative spaces. You know, let's bring in artists to do some of that interpretation and reinterpretation. I must say, reading let's is use the professional Sharon, skills of curators I want to, ask Ian to tell effect. stories. But I don't think we're being invited, are we, on retain and explain, to retain everything where it is on the shelf that it is at this exact moment and just dusting it for the next 500 years. I think the suggestion is that they be retained within the collection rather than um, put in a skip or sold off to um, Bonhams or something so that they can be looked at again um, on the grounds that presumably in the years to come, different audiences are going to see different things in, in different uh, pieces of our history and that it isn't up to one generation, ours, uh, to, to, to make the final cut. Ian, what do you think on this? Well, message? well, um, the reason I'm fairly relaxed about this is that I think I and my fellow museum directors are determined to interpret, retain and explain as narrowly as possible. Because the point is, this is all Samir Shah's fault, um, because I'm teasing him. But my serious point is, there are very few museums which have statues that are part of the great dispute. So we had a very obscure conversation at our last meeting of directors about uh, busts on display. But it's very clear from my conversation with Oliver directly, if you think of the hundreds and hundreds of curatorial decisions my team makes every day, I don't see Retain and Explain affecting any of them. OK, and I think the other thing that's getting confused here is about the independence issue uh, in terms of should the minister have a policy and retain and explain on statues as a bit of planning law? He has every right because it's a democracy. OK, on, on the issue of uh, uh, statues, I just cannot resist making one personal comment. Um, so think, for example, the Baden-Powell statue, where there was that ridiculous fuss about Pearl Harbor. Look. I'm a gay man with a Jewish husband, and Baden-Powell had a number of vile views on queers and Jews. Do I feel an overwhelming desire to hurl it into Pearl Harbor? Quite the opposite. I feel that by leaving it there, I win, okay? Because I think what's needed in this debate about retain and explain is a big leap of conceptual imagination. So I agree with Laura. It's not actually, by the way, about writing the label. It's about the online resources. And the one example I would give, which I keep giving, is James Watt. I can't stress enough that what was presented until recently in the Science Museum is the great, not only a great engineer, but actually the epitome of the greatest type of scientist and man that could ever be. So discovering that he traded in slavery, it matters. And, and all we do now in the labels and on online material is say, guess what? It's more complex and interesting. And here's the point where Sharon and Laura will agree with me. The public is clever enough and imaginative enough to totally get that. Samir. Just, um, yeah, I, I, I mean, you know, for fear of contradicting Peter Ainsworth's thing, I, I think I largely agree with what, what's been said. My own take on Retain and Explain is effectively saying uh, it's a bit of Ian's, you know, add not subtract. The idea behind that is let's not pretend this never happened or didn't exist, but, uh, but acknowledge it, look it in the eye, tell a fuller and more accurate story of that individual. And I think it's entirely... Uh, uh, arguable, and I think it's true, that so far we haven't done that. We've only done a partial story of these of these people. So I think it's entirely right that we should tell a fuller story. I've got a couple of thoughts on that. One is um, proportionality. You know, when we tell the full story, what is the story we tell? Whatever, wherever it is, whether it's in labels or artists or something, you know, the individuals are individuals and we should be proportionate about their relationship. And that throws up a second question for me. You listed four names, Colston, Rustat, Sloan, and Jeffrey. 
Um, and one of the questions we need to wrestle with, are they different? Or is it the case that, you know, a man like Jeffrey who had investments in the Royal African Company and some, and, but no slaves, didn't own any slaves or any plantations, is that person different to Colston? Do we approach it differently? Uh, I think these are questions we need to discuss amongst ourselves so that when we do explain, um, we explain it in a proportionate way. I think that's that's really very important. And on the on the other point that people talked about, decolonization and how we treat our objects, as Ian said, uh, in my view, far too much emphasis has been placed on a, on a statue that's outside our building. Uh, if you look at what, uh, sorry, this is going to be a plug for the Museum of the Home. If you look at what we're trying to do now, and when we reopen, we've gone, we go for a museum of the period rooms of the middling classes, brackets, white classes, in the middle of Hackney. And now we're going to have, in the new museum, a much wider definition of the home. And we're going to look at different cultures, different communities, and so people will understand each other better and live together better. And I think this is the way you evolve from a narrow point of view about a museum and its collection and its role in society to a wider, more inclusive one. So I do well encourage all of you to come to the museum when it opens, but it is rather brilliant. Uh, Samir, I think that's a very good point. I'm about to ask three members of, of, of people who are watching us at home whose names have been sent to me on WhatsApp so we can invite them in, then we'll come back to Ian later. But I just want to say that I have an awful feeling that probably in 150 years' time, when people write about the five of us, if we're remembered at all, everything that they will, the, 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 the label, so to speak, may well begin with the words, Samir Shah had shares in BP, and you probably do through your pension fund without knowing it, or Laura, um, has shares in BP. She was also a distinguished museum curator, and I think in some ghastly way, everything is going to catch up with us. I want to go first to Holly Trusted. Holly, are you going to come live onto our, so we can see you? Is that the plan? I'm here. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, Go ahead. I don't think you can see me. I don't think there's a video option, but um, I'm, I'm wholly trusted. I'm actually honorary senior research fellow at the v &A, but I'm speaking more with my hat on as the um, co-chair of the Public Statues and Sculpture Association, which was founded last year and has been very much involved with these discussions. And just the point I wanted to get the works of art and it's very interesting in in the discussions I think Peter Schumacher's was mentioned this morning but most of the time we don't talk about the artists and the works of art and actually often in fact I would say 99% of the time that is why they're in the museum um, at all they're in the museum because they are um, valued works of art that we want to look at and I think it's really important that we don't forget that dimension when we're talking about their historical problems and I, I do think there are problems and we do need to label and explain no question about that uh, thank you very very much Holly has anyone got this is taking place in other collections as well on the reinterpretation of the portrait of General Thomas Pigton which is currently on display I don't think there are any calls for it or any moves to take it off display but the project that they're doing will provide context by commissioning artists to celebrate Trinidadian culture contemporary culture but also to think about the role that um, that particular individual played as a, a governor of Trinidad so I, I think there's definitely room and potential in art collections to do some of this work of working with communities and source communities to reinterpret and, and again I think that's about broadening and deepening it's not about cancelling and silencing it's about getting more stories into those galleries and get, getting more understanding of the history of the subjects that are on display. Thank you Ian, is your hand up or are you smashing your um, headphone? No, no, I understand Holly's point. I mean, I agree with Sharon. I mean, I can't resist a slightly facetious response, which is whilst it's true that many of the statues that are currently in detention are works of art, some of them are very poor works of art. 
I mean, I mean, it seems to me that that for the for the issues of history, whether it's a good artist or a bad artist is not hard, is not for me the defining issue. So you know, some of the statues of the slave traders are are just horrendous, generic statues. Uh, but that for me doesn't enter the retain and explain. So I, I understand Holly's point, but I don't think it's a winning argument in history. Thank you. And uh, Laura, did I, I did see your hand up. Yes, and then I'm going to move to Anna Reid next. Laura. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just wanted to build on what was being said by others, uh, where I think also, apart from, so as, as Sharon was saying, we're expanding those histories by working with other communities and, 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 and um, adding to them. We're also, that's what we're noticing, is that by working with stakeholders, you know, locally, globally, we're actually also um, building this new rich field of study. So we're building new methodologies of co-curation, increasing uh, the developing also truly groundbreaking insights into how our collections were formed, what the philosophies are behind them, identifying you know, sort of constructs that are obstructing deeper understanding. So I think this goes much way beyond just adding some extra information. Um, this is about, this is informing what are we collecting, who are we collecting with, how, who are we listening to, and really rethinking sort of the shapes of what knowledge is. Thank you. I'm going to call on Anna Reid, who I think is awaiting her moment. Hello. Thanks very much. First of all, thank you to all the panellists um, for your fascinating contributions. I'm very much enjoying this discussion and it's um, great to hear a bit of passion on both sides of the argument. Um, first of all, a quick observation. In Ukraine, uh, there's been a long running issue for years and years now about what to do with all its old Lenin statues. Every town has a Lenin statue in the central square and they've been coming down gradually. Um, but, in, but in some cities where people are fond of their Lenins, uh, they've uh, you know, come to rather witty uh, sort of solutions, compromise solutions. So for example, a Ukrainian, um, the scarf with the colors of the Ukrainian flag um, might be draped around the Lenin's neck um, and in Odessa that they dressed up their Lenin as a as Darth Vader, um, which was quite fun. I don't know if sort of letting loose artists on ceiling and of you know drawing attention to the real history of these figures also. Uh, second thing, um, I mean a lot a lot of these wonderful Victorian museums, you know, their value is in the fact that they are they themselves are artifacts. They themselves are you know, you know, preserved bits of Vict you know, the Victorian mindset and walking around them and looking at what's on display and how it's displayed is an education in itself in Victorian Britain. Uh, and I can, I can see why one wants to change, you don't want to be a director of a museum and just do nothing to it. Um, but the, the sort of the, the best of these Victorian displays, I mean, I would love to see kept just as, uh, you know, as as things in themselves, and then the reinterpretive stuff, the new stuff, put in other other rooms. Um, the third thing, the the this is you'll think this is a, a a narrow point, but the shrunken heads in the pit rivers. Please, can we have them back? You know, children love, you know, ghoulish, edgy, tasteless things, um, and you know, <laughs> keeping them. Please, you know, it's it's what we need to get our, get our, get families in, uh, you know. Laura, can I ask bad taste, bad bad taste where are the shrunken heads now? <laughs> where, where, where actually are they, are they located? Are they in your own office or are they? No, they're not in my own office. They are, uh, they're in, in stores, much like Ian's uh, shrunk, the shrunk, shrunken heads in the uh, Science Museum are uh, in the store. Um, so uh, um, just to answer that question, I think, the way that you've, um, and yes, I have a 16-year-old and a 13-year-old, and I know how, um, you know, it's wonderful when they actually get enthusiastic about going into museums. Mine don't want to go into ethnographic museums anymore. They love contemporary art museums and science museums. So, so it's, it really depends on, uh, you know, I've probably brought them too often into our ethnographic spaces. But um, I, I am... Um, I think that you know how you're describing them as ghoulish and 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 sort of 
um, is, is one of the reasons why, apart from the fact that DCMS guidance actually says that we're not supposed to put human remains on display in the way that we have them on display. So we were following uh, guidance by the government, much like why Ian um, also had to consider in his museum to take the shrunken heads off display. Uh, one of the reasons that we took them off display was because of this way that people were reading the shrunken heads, the tsantsa is completely not uh, helping the way that actually they could be understood. And so what we're doing is working with Schwar communities now, uh, delegates of the Schwar community, Schwar who are you know, the uh, descendants of the communities who made the uh, Tsansa, to see how they would like to be represented. They've indicated that it's really problematic to them. To do, they do not want to be put on display in this way. They do not want to be talked about as violent murderers, because that then reflects on them also in the contemporary. So I think that is where um, we really um, are thinking, you know, sort of with communities. I know that there is a, and it, it's been interesting to sort of see on the one hand, the, and we're doing an analysis of what the reactions are. I've, I have received some really angry letters of people who really do feel that they should be going back up. Uh, but overall, the f feedback has been really positive, also on social media, and the most uh, we're, we're doing an analysis of that. So I've, I've really sort of gone into listening mode to see what are the words that are being used, what are the mm -hmm. reasons that people are giving, and how do we uh, go into that. Um, but what we did put on display instead of the shrunken heads, and I do invite you to come, is to, uh, we've put no, many more objects on display than we've ever taken off display, but, in, but we did put a lot more information on display of why collecting human remains was an integral part of really problematic practices of ranking some societies as savage and barbarous, barbarous and others as mm -hmm. civilized, and that this measuring of skulls and bones provided this scientific aura that upheld really racist ideas and sexist beliefs. And what we notice is that people that come into the museum read this and say, oh my God, I had never made that connection. This is making things much more clear to me now. And actually, some other people sort of saying, oh, this is actually, uh, I'm making me understand my teenagers who are really offended by some of the things that I sometimes say, which are quite sort of problematic. It start, it's making it possible for me to have those conversations with my kids. So I think- Laura, thank you. I'm going to cut you off because I can see Samir's had his hand up for a while. Then I'm going to take a question from Gordon Parker and then I'm coming back to Sir Ian. That's my plan. I, I just want to reflect. I think it's really interesting on Anna's point about the, the children and the ghoulishness and Laura's uh, response to it. The, what the children loved, uh, to me, speaks back to Ian's point about middling England. And the question that one of you asked is, who are we listening to? And as a board and as a, uh, and a chair, I think uh, we, I, I really find it difficult to answer that question when we discuss things. Who are we listening to? Now, of course, it's a cliche to say that those people who are active for change, who want, who want to do things, are going to speak up more because they're interested in bringing about change. Um, those people who aren't, who uh, will not do so because, frankly, you know, it, it doesn't stir them. It's not what they're interested in. And my concern as a as a chair of a board is to try and weigh these voices pro properly and proportionately and to ensure that everybody gets a proper hearing when we come to make a decision um and i find that really quite difficult to do because of course inevitably i'm more likely to hear the voices uh, asking for change and making differences and all that and then and also, and that includes, I mean, Sharon, Laura, and others have all talked about listening to their communities and listening to artists. But, but the question continues to assert itself is, who are you listening to? And how representative are they of the, of the people at large? And what are, you, what are people doing to ensure that there is this representativeness and that we are not simply moving with the fashions of the day, I, you know, I I, 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 I think that the astute chair, if I can answer your question, um, should be trying to talk to um, hanging out a bit with staff of all ages and also visitors, not at all to be cutting across the role of the director, but just having a little bit of a sense um, of, 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 the, of the great breadth of the type of people who visit some of the great museums. Now, what I want to do now 
is invite two people. One is, he says, reopening his phone, Gordon Parker, and then Daniel Bisset, who are the two who've been trying to get on. Can we hear from you, Gordon, and then immediately from Daniel, so that we have a chance for our panel to respond to you both, since you're the last, probably going to be the last two questions. Gordon. Okay. Uh, the solution, uh, the question is, is the solution to the question of museums, galleries, statues, etc., simply to educate people better to include the dark side of our history as well as the, as well as the good. Essentially, provide a better understanding of the truth, particularly within the context of the history of this nation. I think that's an extremely good question. And can we now have Daniel Bisse so we can answer them both together? Yeah, I just wanted to raise the point that's being made, kind of made in the chat and uh, also regarding the question that I'd like to ask panelists because there's been a lot of points made rather than questions. Um, but the question that I'd like to hear from the panelists is how can we ensure that um, young people, especially in an academic historical context within history curriculums, are well informed about the huge and the, sorry, that are educated properly about the hugely important role and the hugely um, bloody role um, that the British Empire held in colonial conquests and in um, colonial um, uh, uh, poss possessiveness of, of certain objects that are now on display. And how can we ensure that those um, educational specters, as a young person in humanities, how can I ensure that I'm being given the correct information? Ian. Okay, to respond, to both of them. First, I just want to read something, might surprise you. This is from a letter I received. It says, our aim should be to fully contextualize our heritage and use it to educate the public about all aspects of Britain's complex history, both good and bad. Well, who wrote that? The Oliver, Oliver Dowden wrote that, okay? Uh, and, and, and my point is, this is why this debate becomes a bit weird, um, because uh, in terms of Gordon's response, Absolutely. And my point is this, which is actually Middle England, the people I'm trying to represent in this conversation, have been ready for that discussion for decades, which is why this conversation, there's a kind of danger here that some people like Laura have become this pantomime villain. But actually, this is just getting grotesque, actually. Um, on this question about young people, two comments. The first is, enough with young people. And what I mean by that is there is an issue about um, our role with young people. And after all, my museum gets more of, uh, school visits than any other museum in Europe. But actually, it is so crucial that we remember the breadth of our audiences in terms of ages. Because remember that parents, brothers and sisters, granny and granddad, carers, partners, they are all part of the historic narrative. It's because also many of our older visitors are people who vote. I really can't stress enough how it irritates the pants off me when people think we only talk to young people. But on the question of curriculum, it's very clear when you talk to schools who come to us that they see us as not a direct part of the curriculum, but providing fresh insight. So I think it's a dialogue. I would say that there is not a clear linear relationship relationship between the great museums and the Department of Education, to which my response is, thank God for that, that actually we do something different. And I think it's our different scholarship that adds to the knowledge of children rather than just being a classroom, because if we become a classroom, they just won't come to us anymore. Ian, thank you very much. Would any of the other three, Laura and then yeah. Sharon, just to um, pick up uh, both Gordon and Daniel's question, I think around sort of truth and 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 um, and telling that truth more, you know, sort of in all its you know, complexities, but especially also those parts that are more uncomfortable and more difficult uh, to hear, uh, if one is sort of you know, in, which I think is why. Um, it's a bit confusing what we're being told by government at times. That on the one hand, they're saying, do go into all the complexities, do sort of you know, explain things, which is exactly what we're doing. But at the same time, which is a bit through Daily Telegraph and not so necessarily maybe in the voices directly. So they're telling us, but don't go down on Britain. Don't say that, you know, sort of the, the difficult parts. Don't, you know. And I think that is where 
we are limiting ourselves because what we want to do is to tell the whole story, right? So, and I think for us, especially, um, Daniel, to, to speak to your question, that is such a crucial component. And I know that the University of Oxford, for example, the history department is working with schools. They're working on secondary you know, uh, materials for secondary educations. It is one of the reasons that teachers aren't teaching those modules often is because there's so little material they can work with. So for universities to play a role there, for museums to play a role there, we're also working with the exams board to sort of see what would we be able to help with to actually start bringing these into the curriculum much more. It is what students are demanding for change in the curriculum also, because we are currently just sort of limiting some of our, um, our, um, our offer. Laura, thank you. We've got two minutes left, and I want to get three more people in. Sharon, you have 30 seconds, then Samir. Just quickly then, um, I agree that museum audiences are not uh, 90 plus, but I think young people are important and a critical part of our audiences. I think we can, museums can play a really good role in rounding out the educational learning experience and tackling some of these difficult and contested, contentious areas. And if government really does support this work of expanding and deepening and broadening, Fund it. Fund us to do it. We can do it really well with our communities. Thank you, Sharon. Samir. Samir. Yeah, I just want to make a, a, a final uh, kind of observation about, you asked whether this is abating or, or not, but I think it's going to continue to grow. I think there's a real movement here. And I want to say something slightly personal about this growth, of, and that's to do with being a British Indian and whose parents were jailed by British colonialism. Uh, one of the things that worries me is, is the attempt to make us all victims of, of ghastly white people. And of course, we were during imperialism and British slavery. But if you want to tell the full story of the impact, say, of the British Empire, and I'll give an example because you talked about education. One of the things the British Empire did was to build a load of educational institutions in India to, to educate a mass of Indians to run the empire for them. The country was way too big to run on their own. Fine. But what has modern India done? It is built on that education. We now have the most extraordinary set of educational institutions, producing graduates who are our IT specialists, who are fantastic people, management schools that run major organizations like Google. So as you tell the story of the empire and its legacy in the modern period, don't always paint us as, as, victims, of a, of a, as victims of the story. We are not only victims. We have agency. We are now doing things in the modern world. We won't come out of this imperial legacy, but we're, we are actually doing things. So when you teach 15-year-old kids in schools, or you write things, don't paint us as just victims. Thank you. And on that note, I would like to thank our four panelists. And I'd just like to leave you with a thought. The four most popular objects out of the 2,700,000, I'm exaggerating slightly, in the BNA are the following four. It's the mechanical um, toy of Tipu's tiger, beloved by children and old, um, the plaster cast of Trajan's column, uh, Queen Victoria's coronet, a new um, piece, and Mick Jagger's jumpsuit. I don't know what it says about us, but it says, seems to me that diversity in that way is exactly what we should be doing. It is now a quarter of an hour loo break. You have to be ready. At, I've been asked to remind you at 15.30, where the Secretary of State in person um, will address the conference. Thank you all very much indeed. Goodbye.
those of you who sat in for the panel uh, exchanges, particularly the last one, which seemed characteristically lively uh, and of a policy exchange type, we'll be going for a robust uh, debate, though I, I'm still recovering from um, Ian Blatchford's uh, declaration that somebody had been irritating the pants of him. Uh, it uh, evokes an image which will stay with me forever. Now, we have an hour with a sector of state, and this is uh, unusual. I have to say it's about 20 years since I myself um, have done a television in interview with a cabinet member, and that's not because we wanted to stop doing them, but because, uh, frankly, the cabinet uh, ministers uh, got small and scared. So it is a real pleasure, and I start with admiration for a politician who's willing to submit himself to a conversation of any length greater than eight minutes. Oliver Dowden, who is the MP for Hartsmere, is also Secretary of State for Digital, Culture, Media and Sport, once called the Ministry of Fun, but actually now probably better described as a ministry for the bed of hard nails. Robert, uh, I'm now hearing myself back through here. Oh, wait in. Oh, sorry. Right, right. Forgive me, everybody. We're back. We're back together. Um, so, it's uh, it, Oliver, as well as being the Secretary of State for DCMS, is a policy guy, ex-Conservative Party Research Department. In recent times, some people, I think, have tried to turn him into a sort of Norman Tebbit de nos jours after calling museum directors together uh, as a sort of person who's going to tell everybody what's what. But I myself don't think he quite fits the leather jacket. And the gathering this week seems to have emerged as rather calm and thoughtful. And that's certainly the account that we got from a couple of the people who were there who were on our last panel. Um, where, where we're going to do this, I will start with some questions for the Secretary of State and then at some point in the next uh, half an hour, 35 minutes or so, uh, we will open this to you. By all means, submit questions on the chat and we will try to get to as many as we can. I'm sorry, I gather there was a, hiatus, there was a, a problem earlier on, but we will try and do our best to include as many people this time. So, Secretary of State, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Now, most people would say that the cultural sector has, in this country, has flourished by artists and administrators being insulated from government and from politicians not sticking their fingers into their business. So let's start with this. What business is it of yours? What goes into the VNA? Well, the, the first thing to say is I don't want to be picking up the phone and interfering in the um, independence of our great cultural institutions. And you're absolutely right, they have flourished through that uh, independence. And uh, as I made clear in the, the conversation that I, I had with our, our major institutions, not only do I respect that independence and want to uphold it, also we've ensured that we've got the resources into our cultural institutions and heritage is a real passion of mine. And uh, I'm delighted that both in the original Cultural Recovery Fund and in the, the Chancellor's announcement, which I think has been well trailed enough into today's papers that I can talk about it, we're ensuring the money is in going into to cultural institutions. But I'm equally clear who is actually funding that, who's paying. It's not, it's not me or indeed uh, Rishi Sunak who's writing the check for those institutions. It's the taxpayer who's paying uh, the bill. And I feel that it's my duty as the Secretary of State to defend the interests of the wider public who fund institutions. And all I've, I've really said is, the people who run institutions, I'm, I'm acutely conscious as Secretary of State, and certainly Secretary of State for, for, for DCMS, uh, we tend to come and go relatively quickly. I'm, 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 a, I'm a veteran myself after just a, a, a year here. I'm acutely conscious of my duty as a temporary custodian of our national heritage. And I know that uh, museums should be equally aware, and I think the Leech of Museums are aware of their their duties as temporary custodians of our heritage and their principal role to protect and conserve our heritage. And in doing that, just as independence means 
that they should not be subject to the will of um, politicians. They should equally stop, pause, take a breath and not be uh, pushed around by campaign groups who often purport to represent wider communities that they simply don't represent. They should be taking more seriously, and I think they, they are taking seriously, their, their duties as temporary custodians of, of our national heritage and just take a slightly calmer approach to all of this. But, uh, well, let me ask you, uh, in a way, if you're the representative of, uh, as it were, the man or woman in, um, I don't know, Borenwood High Street, uh, how do you deal with the question that that person is probably most likely to ask you? Uh, Mr. Sunak is about to bung you 400 million tomorrow for these institutions, which are just busy de decolonizing everything in sight. That would get us 10,000 nurses. Really, what are you about? What, what is the point of that? Well, first of all, I think that the culture institutions massively enrich us. They, they enrich our souls and all of us who've gone to our great national institutions, whether that's the DNA, the, the National Gallery. I, I said this when the National Gallery re reopened. They are genuinely people's palaces. It's wonderful that uh, these institutions exist. They're free for people to be able to, to enter and see that wonderfully rich heritage. Uh, and of course, they, they generate much wider um, economic benefits, empowering our, our position as, uh, as a forefront of creative industries. We're one of the creative industry superpowers. But uh, they also have that duty to ensure that uh, those institutions preserve that wonderfully rich heritage. And I think if people say to me anything on the, the streets of Boreham Wood about this, they are, and, and elsewhere, people are bemused at the kind of uh, arguments that are being had now. This. Um, there's a sort of uh, a tendency to, to try and rewrite chunks of history. Of course, we, we need to continuously reevaluate uh, our history and, and learn the lessons of the past. And I certainly don't advocate uh, keeping things in aspic. But equally, I think strong societies uh, don't try and airbrush their past. They don't try and hide it away. They, they preserve and they cherish their heritage. And we, I'm acutely conscious that we, we stand on the, the shoulders of our parents, our grandparents, our great-great-grandparents in terms of this wonderfully rich heritage. The principal duty of institutions is, is to preserve that, to retain it, but also to explain it and make it relevant to, to, to every generation. I think uh, institutions do a very good job of that. Well, you, you've, you've um, touched on what I suppose is one of the, the uh, issues here. The government's uh, advocate, advocates uh, advocating a policy of retrain and explain. Let, let's talk about that a bit. Um, at what point are you suggesting, and for what reason, uh, should anybody be explaining anything that much more? Is this a continuous process, or are there things that you think should trigger such an explanation? And at what point? Uh, and in what circumstances might an explanation be so impossible that actually you need to remove the exhibit? Do you ever envisage that that's a, a, that is something that's worth doing or not doing? Well, I think the great strength that we have from retaining our heritage, whether that's that statues, uh, um, our physical heritage and museum exhibitions and so on, is it provides an opportunity to explain our past. I think it's a much stronger position to retain and, and use that to explain our past. I, I do just worry that in all of this, that institutions don't succumb to campaign groups who purport to speak for a, a wider population. For example, if they purport to, to speak for the, 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 the BAME community, although it was a very interesting survey by the Times the other day saying that 84% of, of, of Black Britons do not uh, support the removal of, of heritage. I think most people in this country uh, believe in retaining our heritage, preserving what is so wonderful, but also using it as an opportunity to explain our rich history. And the rich history that, uh, that both um, has a history of uh, colonialism, but at the same time, uh, the Enlightenment and how those different trends of histories fit together is fascinating and we should be drawing out all those riches and certainly I mean I went to I, I always pay tribute to the school I went to I was very fortunate to go to a great comprehensive school my local comprehensive school um, and I don't say this is a disservice to them at all but we didn't really talk about uh, 
our imperial history in, 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 in any way as a nation. It was kind of hidden away. I think we should be using all of this to, to, to talk to talk about our history, to, to engender a greater understanding and, and to, to build a sense of how we all own this. I feel humbled when I go into an institution like uh, the, the BNA or the, the, the National Gallery or the Natural History Museum to think that I collectively own this with with you, Trevor, and with um, with all of my constituents and all, all the, the people in the United Kingdom. It is ours. It belongs to us. Our principal duty must be to preserve that, to conserve it, but also to use it to enhance our collective understanding, not, not to throw it into the political domain. If anything, coming back to your original point about the, the, the culture wars, I, I'm, I've, uh, I've sort of, I'm slightly bemused that uh, when there are arguments to remove statutory, uh, to, to, to destroy our history in, in some senses, um, it's not political to advocate that, but somehow I'm accused of wading into politics by saying, hang on, is that the right thing to be doing? Of course, one of the, the um, things that is being said about you and your intervention here is that actually, uh, the truth is that what you're doing is stoking the cultural wars. What you really want to do is have a massive noisy row to distract everybody from whatever people think that the government's done wrong on COVID or on the economy and so on. Um, how do you deal with the allegation that really what you're doing is providing a cover for the government's mistakes by uh, stoking up a war over something that is really not happening very often, not very significant, and nobody cares about very much? Well, I'd say two things. First of all, it's an odd time to be stoking a distraction when actually I think we can be very proud of the, the work that we've done in relation to, to the vaccine rollout, uh, for example. We're, we're genuinely world leaders in that sense. So it's a, it's a, it's a bit of misplaced politics if it was, was driven from that, that political uh, perspective. Secondly, though, I, I say, well, how come it's, it's not political? It's entirely apolitical to campaign to remove statutory. How come it's politically is is apolitical to try and rewrite large chunks of history but it is political for a culture secretary who is ultimately the upholder of taxpayers interests uh to to say well hang on is that the right thing to do in national interest and i think the the construct this hasn't been a war actually we've had a very constructive debate about how we go through this um process how we how we make sure for example, and um, what we agreed with at this, uh, the, the round table I had was, let's, let's draw up some guidelines and parameters about how we, we use explain as a way of ensuring that we tell the rich history of this nation. Let's talk about um, the point at which you think it is right for you to, let's, let's put it in the most um, gentle terms possible, remind cultural institutions of their responsibilities. I mean, uh, I, you, you're too busy as a Secretary of State to go about making judgments on every new display or uh, every new strategy in the hundreds of organisations which are supported by the taxpayer. What will trigger your interest in a change or a decision that's going to be made about a statute or about a, an exhibit in a museum? Well, what are the principles by which you're going to be judging the need for you to stand up for the taxpayers you're putting in? Well, well the first thing to say is I, I, I certainly do not want to be getting into individual subjective judgments about curatorial decisions that's been taken by uh, our, our independent uh, institutions. The stance I'm taking is to take quite a big step backwards and say, well, hang on, the left has been quietly for years making these subjective decisions, pushing these institutions. I'm the first culture secretary to just stand up and say, well, hang on, just think as institutions about your wider duty to the nation, your wider duty to conserve and preserve our heritage. Don't allow yourself to be pushed around by the zeitgeist of the day. Take a longer term view of things. Make sure you do things in a rigorous way and understand that your principal duty is to preserve and conserve our, our heritage. And actually, what I've done through the conversations I've had with them is think, right, how do we then turn that into a, a sort of robust process? That's why I'm trying to get a, a group of experts together working with the institutions 
to say, look, the, 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 this is the, the, the way we, we approach it. And actually, one of the things that prompted me to come in into this debate in the first place was, was talking to some institutions who felt that they were being bullied, particularly by left-wing campaigns. There were actually um, threats of uh, defunding through certain in institutions. And they said, well, how, how do we stand up to this? And what, what I want to do is make sure that we have uh, robust processes which ensure we pause, we reflect, we do so on the basis of a principle that is agreed with historic England and, and, and most uh, institutions, which is we retain and we explain. And um, of course, we must constantly uh, examine our, our past, but, but we don't try and judge everything by the standards of, uh, of, of today. Now, that doesn't mean for a minute I walk away from the abhorrence of slavery or any of these other things. What I'm saying is that, that let's just try and be, be a little bit more calm in the approach that we take and do this in a rigorous way, rather than being pushed around either by campaign groups or indeed the, the zeitgeist of, of current sort of a curatorial thought in some sections. Right, so don't follow fashion, adopt process. I want to come to the issue of process in a moment. But, um, uh, I mean, I've asked you the sort of questions that a lot of people in the sector would ask you uh, already, but I wanted to um, address it maybe from a slightly different point of view. Um, and uh, this point of view says, well, you're telling us that you're not provoking the culture wars. You are not going to interfere. Why not? Are you just going to allow what is largely a white middle-class elite that runs our great cultural institutions, not a single ethnic minority head of a major um, major in, a museum in this country, uh, you're going to let them take the whole responsibility for telling our national story? Well, I think two things. First of all, we need to ensure that our cultural institutions, the leadership of our cultural institutions, uh, reflect the nation uh, at large. And I've, I've always, and I did this in previous roles as a minister in the cabinet office, I, I believe strongly in ensuring that we have a diverse uh, boards and diverse leadership for two reasons. First of all, the, the moral duty. I think these great institutions, if they are owned by the nation, they should be governed by the nation. They should, their leadership should reflect the nation as a whole. And secondly, I think that uh, diverse boards make uh, more robust decisions because they take into account different perspectives. And indeed, you know, if you take DCMS, we have made uh, a lot of progress. For example, 29% of our most recent appointments have been from a, a BAME background. And I know that uh, our, the leads of our institutions take that responsibility um, very seriously. But as, as I said, I think the, the trap one can fall into is, is almost to say, say a sort of divisive approach and say, well, at the, um, the, 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 the BAME community has a very different uh, view of, of how we approach our culture and, and heritage to, to, uh, to, to other communities. I don't, haven't seen much evidence of that. In fact, I've, I've seen a lot of evidence of the contrary. As I said, and the, I thought the latest evidence from the, the Times uh, survey showing that 84% uh, of, of Black Britons uh, supported uh, not getting rid of heritage shows that I think uh, I'm just trying to take the middle ground position here, which is to to conserve, to retain, to, to understand the, the duties that we have as temporary custodians of our, our heritage and to uphold that duty. Well, uh, let, let's push that a little, a little further. What you, my, you, I think, know my um, former professional colleague, uh, Samir Shah, the chair of the uh, Jeffrey Museum, well, in the previous panel today, um, Samir made, I thought, rather an important point which is that at the moment, when the cultural sector approaches these minority communities, the overriding narrative is one of victimhood. And he gave, I thought, a rather good example in which he said that the Raj had created all these universities and you could have your objections to what was, de what was developed under the Raj on, in colonial times and so on, but India, has taken those institutions and built them into world-leading Indian institutions with a different cultural approach, a different sort of leadership, and so on. And that the agency of people from minority backgrounds is hardly ever reflected in the story that is told by our cultural 
institutions. Does that strike a resonance with you? And is that something that you, insofar as you give guidance to the leaders of the cultural sector, something that you might ask them to think about now? Well, Trevor, I think that that is the the essence of what I was I was, I was getting at in some of my my previous remarks, which is when we examine our history, we we have to. It's important that we understand the richness of and what you're talking about there is how uh, Britain adopted uh, Enlightenment values very early, and those were reflected through our. Uh, cultural institutions, and indeed through um, our through through many aspects of um, British uh, policy, in, in for example, uh, India. And what the interesting thing about our history is how the abhorrence of the, the the slavery can sit alongside Enlightenment values, and those values in turn can shape the world today. Most of the sort of norms that we take, even to today. Uh, 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 um, in terms of our sort of the scientific method or the, the approach to educational institutions derives from that history and in turn is being built upon uh, in, in the sort of way that Samir has described, and I've discussed this with, with, with Samir in, in the examples that he cited. But you know, what the, you, you know what the criticism of that is? Let's glorify the Enlightenment. Let's talk about the wonderful things we do, we've done. Uh, and actually, all that slavery business, all the colonial oppression, all the lack of opportunities for people that uh, were part of the empire, that all comes second to telling everybody how wonderful we were. No, and I, I, I completely reject that. And I think that, uh, that my point is that one shouldn't go the other way. So I think there's, uh, in crude terms, if it was the case in the Edwardian era that there was a a, a whitewash of, 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 of paint the, the, the map pink and didn't we, we we gave them the railways and the the the, the courts and wasn't it all wonderful one shouldn't then move to a position of entirely denigrating our history in such a way that that, that denies the other uh, aspects of it which have uh, shaped the the modern world and indeed it's not just um globally but in within the U uk so for example i was fascinated to to read that Abraham Lincoln, uh, during the, the, the Civil War, wrote to the, or around the time of the Civil War, wrote, wrote to the working men of Manchester to thank them for not processing uh, cotton that was picked by slaves. We have a very, very rich history. And all I'm saying this is, let's, we should be telling this whole story, and I pay tribute to, to institutions that, by the way, the, 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 Again, one, one, can, one can sort of, in cliche, characterize the position of institutions and pretend they haven't changed since the 1960s or 70s. They have done huge amounts of work to tell the diverse story of our nation. And I uh, salute them for, for, for what they've done. And to a, to a large extent, I think they've done an awful lot of this uh, work already. I think the bigger risk now comes from uh, being pushed around by unrepresentative campaign groups principally from the left, who put bullying pressure on institutions to rapidly change their approach, to remove our history, to, to remove um, items, statues and so on, in a very short-termist way, not taking a rigorous historical uh, approach. And I think that, that is a danger that needs to be guarded against, because it can take generations to build history, as you know, and heritage, and it can take just a few short-termist uh, decisions to, to remove it and to remove it for good. Okay, this is not uh, my interview. I'm not interviewing myself, but I'll just enter, enter one small plea for those of us who are veteran lefties to distinguish between us and some of the nihilists who claim yeah. to be on the left. Yes. No, that, but, that, um, that, that, sorry, and that's a very good point. And what I, uh, I, I should say, and I often say this, is I distinguish between the, the traditional that my grandfather was a trade unionist who was was in the trade union movement to improve the the lot of of, of, of working uh, people. I think that exactly in the way that you described the the new nihilist left is 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 the danger here, and it is an emergent danger. It's certainly not a, a danger that that we had in previous uh, generations. So um, let's well let's let's talk about how let let's talk about how we make these decisions because you you said that part of your role in your what you want to do is to make sure that decisions are made in a calm and rational uh, and uh, understood way that we can hear the voice of the taxpayer in decision making uh, how do you 
encourage advocacy for the public uh, when the professionals who make the decisions want to do something different? Or to put it another way, how do the decision makers with whom you entrust public funds decide whose voice counts? Is it by proximity, the people who live next door to the museum or the gallery? Is it by expert voices or is it by those who make the greatest noise? I mean, what, what's the guidance here? Well, well, first of all, I should say this is why we have independent institutions and we get very good, capable people to, to lead them, to make those judgments. So remember the, the leadership of our, we describe many of them as arm's length bodies from uh, government org organizations that are funded uh, by government. They are empowered to take those decisions, but they should take those duties. And I believe they do take them seriously to make those kind of balanced judgments and in precisely the way that you allude to, not to be uh, unnecessarily swayed by campaign groups that purport to speak for a larger uh, community, which they don't. So to take a much more objective uh, view of that, and also just to challenge what can sometimes be a symbiosis between that and the, the, the zeitgeist of uh, some uh, elements of current thinking uh, in the some elements of the curatorial community. And that's that's really their, jo their job. And what I want to do as culture secretary is to empower them. I do not want to be in the position of overruling them or overriding them, but I equally cannot ignore when I hear from some of them that they feel subject to that pressure and they want government to, to, to stand up to it. And secondly, uh, my duty to the taxpayers who fund those institutions who equally do not get involved in the interscenes of this debate, but, but want to make sure that our institutions fulfill their, their principal duty, which is of, of conservation. I want to come to the issue of curatorial independence in a moment before we go out to the, the people who others who are on the Zoom. But um, what you suggested there is that there is uh, potentially an alliance between the people that you and I might have described a moment ago as nihilist leftists and some in the curatorial community to do things which... Uh, would be against the interests of the taxpayers, or certainly not with the approval of the taxpayer. How do you judge at what point it is right for you to step in? Well, I, I, I think that is the job of the leadership of institutions, the, the, the independent boards that we appoint to make uh, those judgments. And I should say to guard against that sort of uh, that sort of risk. Uh, it's also, um, I think, part of my job to bring to bring uh, institutions together in the way that we've described to, to, to ensure that we have proper processes for making decisions. So, for example, one of the points that's been raised by me, with me by some institutions is what, what proper process of consultation uh, should, should we go through? How do we ensure that we, to your point, get a proper national perspective uh, and not get d distracted by, uh, by by other um, factors. We don't we don't we don't oil the squeakiest wheel all the all all the time. And that's I'm I'm very keen. Sorry if I, I keep coming back to this point, but this this is the point that I really want to, to stress in all this. I don't want us to have uh, a row over this. I but I have to make sure that we have um, work with the institutions, make sure we have proper processes in place to guard against uh, the risks that the, the, the interests of um, the, the, the public that, that fund institutions and uh, the interests of the, in, the long-term interests of the independence of those uh, institutions are not subverted by the, 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 those that shout the loudest. Well, let's let's address this issue then of uh, how it actually works in practice. Because you've set a, a, a stream of work in in train with the institutions to try to work out how to do this. Let's take a couple of examples. What happens if uh, let's call it the curatorial community in a particular institution decides they want to make a change? They are going to rewrite uh, a narrative, or they are going to move an exhibit, and so on but that actually they simply 
well, let, let me put it the other way. You, they, they consult, and people say, actually, we want it left as it is. But they then decide, we still want to change it. And we've seen a couple of examples of this. Is that where you step in? Well, I, I think that is where the, the, first, the, the first line of defence on that is having strong independent leadership of institutions who are capable of taking the longer term view and acting um, objectively. Secondly, to make sure that those, the leadership of those institutions have the proper corporate governance knowledge and the, the proper leadership skills to make sure con consultations are, are conducted properly, they're not hijacked by, by one group or, or another, that they're responded to um, appropriately. But if it is ultimately the case that, um, and, and this has, without getting into to individual cases too much, I think you're, you're familiar with, with, with some of that. I don't want to draw these into to individual examples, but if it is the case that uh, a consultation has clearly made a, uh, uh, a, a decision, a consultation has properly been, been conducted in the, the right way and that they're still ignoring it, then of course we, we would want to have a discussion um, uh, about that. Uh, in order to make sure that the governance is conducted properly in these institutions. So I'd rather we see it through the process of ensuring that there is proper governance of those institutions in order to make sure that the robust decision-making processes, in order to avoid creating a mirror of what I fear is happening on the other side, which is that, that, um, that institutions get pushed around by noisy campaign groups. I equally need to show restraint to Secretary of State for Culture in, 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 in uh, directly intervening. I would much rather that we make sure that we, we build robust and strong institutions that are capable of, of, of taking those decisions. But the key thing is that independence cuts both ways. It is independence from uh, government and it is independence from the, 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 the zeitgeist of the moment and short-term decisions that, that our children or grandchildren will look back as constantly, why on earth? Uh, did they do that? And by the way, we've seen this in the past. You know, look around the landscape of our, of some of our beloved um, towns and cities. The most scarring didn't come from the Luftwaffe bombs. It came by from misplaced idealism in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s that that disfigured our our built landscape in a way that we we bitterly regret now. I uh, I, sp I spent 20 years reporting London and the. Uh, the the consequences of the building boom of the 1960s. So I know exactly what you're talking about. But if I can just lastly, just stick with this for a moment. Okay, let's not talk about any named um, examples, because I know you don't want to go there. It probably isn't proper for you to. But let's say, let's say uh, you are contacted by the chair of a university institution which has you know, a statue or it has uh, an, a museum or something in it. And everybody knows, having been consulted, the, uh, the students and the alums, uh, the alumni, and also the local community, that the ch a change that is proposed, let's get rid of this image, let's take change, change the name, that that is not universally accepted and probably uh, the majority of those consulted are against it. But as quite often happens, the leadership of the, the council of the university, the authorities are to some extent captured by those they work who work for them. And the worst thing, and they are balancing not just what's right here, but what gives us least trouble. Now, they appeal to you. What do you do? Um, well, and I have done this in, in the past. If they are an arm's length body, so if they're a body that is I directly fall under my purview as Secretary of State, then I would uh, meet with the, the leadership and help them work through this and try and stiffen their sinews against doing what is politically expedient in the short term and help bolster them and say the government will stand by you in doing the, the right thing. Secondly, uh, clearly, if there are universities clearly fall within the purview of the, the Secretary of State for Education. But also, of course, any significant change would require listing consent. Historic England have been very clear about 
their approach to um, retain and explain. I've worked closely with them and with the, the uh, Secretary of State for MHCLG to make sure that we have clear guidance around that to provide a protection there to protect our, our heritage in uh, that, that fashion. And of course, I will make sure that I discharge my duty as Secretary of State for Culture. And I've said I won't shy away from talking about culture just because I am the Secretary of State for, for, for Culture in meeting with those arm's length bodies and seeing what I can do to support the, the leadership if they feel that they are under uh, unacceptable pressure or I feel that they are they are um, being subject to um, uh, doing what is politically expedient in the, the short run to, to avoid, um, you know, uh, in, infuriating one particular group. And I think that's, but that's again, all, all of that is through the prism of making sure that I stand behind and support strong, robust leadership that takes a long-term view of our heritage, that does so on an evidence basis, that has proper consultation processes so that we can do this in a, a proper effective uh, way that, that withstands public um, scrutiny and lasts for the long term. So there's some, in, in a sense, in a summary, this Secretary of State is not going to be crawling all over museums and, and so on and interfering. However, this Secretary of State does expect people to do their jobs and will be letting them know if he thinks they're not doing their jobs. Well, uh, I think it's always been the case that the Secretary of State for Culture has made sure that the, the leadership of institutions do their job properly and I'll continue to do that. I suppose if you were trying to draw a, a distinction between uh, me and previous culture secretaries, and this is not you know, sort of historically not any, any individual culture secretary, I do think that in the face of increasing hostile activism, I should, uh, it is part of my duty, part of the sea of the culture of my job title to stand behind those institutions in being robust in facing down those threats and the reason why I should do that is because I also owe a duty and my principal duty is not to individuals in any institution who happen to be working there for a short period of time it's to the preservation of our our national heritage for the the long run and for the taxpayers who ultimately are writing these checks the 300 million pounds as I said that the the, the the Chancellor has announced say, 90 million for our, our big national institutions. Ultimately, it's my constituents and the constituents of, of, of every member of parliament who are paying that from their taxes. They have a voice and that voice should be heard. And I, and, uh, but I want to do that not in a way of uh, inserting my subjective opinion, but making sure that there are robust institutions that take a long-term view. Okay, here's a written question from someone. Does the government intend to withdraw funding from institutions currently receiving public funds that make drastic changes relating to public presentation and interpretation of history without due process? In a way, what we've been discussing, uh, and I suspect there's a pretty straight answer on that. Well, I, I don't want to take money away from anyone. I want to give them more money, and that's what I've done. I, I, I know that the huge value of heritage to us as a, as a uh, nation and uh, if you look at the sense of place that is built by having rich heritage, um, there's huge value to it. And actually, we've prioritised putting more money into heritage than ever. And the, the Culture Recovery Fund, I've deliberately prioritised uh, heritage. What I would say to those institutions that I have said is that bear in mind that ultimately you are funded by the taxpayer and you have, you have to uh, take those duties to the taxpayer uh, very seriously, and I wrote, I wrote out to them to that effect, and that's very much in the public domain. Paul Marshall asks, what will you do if Sadiq Khan's commission decides to ban all monuments or reference to Nelson or Churchill? Does he have the power to do that, and whose jurisdiction is it? Well, that, that is, a, obviously, I would object vigorously to both those, those uh, things. We, the, I won't get into the, uh, the minute uh, complexities of the governance arrangements of the statutory in Parliament Square. Suffice to say, there are a range of stakeholders, and it's not just the Mayor of London. It's um, uh, but you know it's, how this historic work. England and others. And I will be making sure that uh, again, the the wider interests of the public are represented in that debate. So, on your watch, Nelson is not going to be moving from where he is. Uh, 
No, <laughs> it's the very short answer. I will do everything possibly possible within my power to ensure that happens. <laughs> Uh, I think I might even I might even go for one of those uh, preposterous politicians saying that I would happily chain myself to Nelson to stop him being removed. I I I, I was wondering whether it was going to be chains or the or standing in front of the bulldozer that well, came out. There. Let, let's let's put it both 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 those ways. I think I can say that confidently for Nelson and Churchill. <laughs> okay, let's go to a live question from Sakela Ngamilo. Sakela. Um, hello, this has been really interesting to listen to and looking at the chat, um, there are quite a few people that are upset with the language that's been used, for instance, activism when re referring to people that may be concerned about these issues. Um, and I think that's just, be I just wanted to, to raise that point to sort of bring up the fact that maybe in the future when talking about these issues, you, you might want to be a bit more careful with the language that you use. Um, you mentioned throughout what um, Oliver you mentioned throughout um, campaign groups and you argue that they didn't represent the people that they um, say that they represent and I wanted to ask what you might what it is that you represent and I also wanted to ask what you do to hear the voices of the people who you say aren't represented by these lobbying groups and what do you actually do in response for instance if 84 percent what would you do that isn't simply removing yourself from the from the um, conversation and allowing um, the curators and the people working in the museums to deal with it? What active role do the government take? Uh, well, well, thank you for those, those, those questions. They are, they're very important points to address. I think that um, I would distinguish between um, activism and uh, debate. It is perfectly legitimate and right that we should have a a, a robust uh, discussion debate about that. It has never been the case that our institutions have preserved our history in aspic, and they, they should not do so uh, in, in future. And they, they've done a great job in ensuring that many different perspectives are reflected in the curatorial decisions that they have taken. My point about activism is my, my concern lies in uh, people that- hold, hold on for a second, uh, Oliver, somebody's- um... We're getting some voices across. Okay, great. Carry on. And Robert, I'm not getting anything on the chat. That, that we avoid the, the situation where um, a group of people purport to speak for a larger community and don't. Um, and uh, on, on the point about, uh, you know, what if, if, if positions change? Well, if positions change, position, positions uh, change, but it's simply I've not seen evidence that it is the case that for uh, for the majority of the the BAME community or indeed the majority of the wider community, there is a strong desire to remove uh, statues. Uh, I think that what there is a strong desire for, and I share this strong desire, is to make sure that that we use our rich history as a way of of um, talking about the the past and developing our understanding of the past. Um, I can't see any questions coming in, so, but I, I, I have a question which is, in a way, maybe a personal one, but one which I think uh, is not often dealt with by uh, politics, though from what some of the things you said today, uh, you may be one of the few politicians I, I, I speak to who will understand what I'm about to ask you. There is a tendency, particularly in um, what some of my friends ris uh, uh, sort of rather snarkily call the self-righteous sector, but let's call it the liberal-minded um, intelligentsia, people who live in the, where I live in North London and so on, to take the views of minority communities as though those communities and everybody in them has the same view. And, you know, for example, you've used the expression BAME a few times today as, and I, I'm not, this is not a criticism because that's normal usage in this country, but it somehow suggests that somebody of Pakistani Muslim background on any given question will have the same view as somebody who is of African background from, let us say, Lagos, and who in turn will have the same view as somebody who grew up in Kingston, Jamaica. Now, this is absurd. And when it's put like that, everybody understands that. But isn't there a real problem here that the, that 
it, it's not just a question of hearing more voices, but actually understanding um, where those voices are coming from. What is it that they are trying to say? Because I suspect lots of people from minority communities do go along with the view that there are whole threads of our history as a country which are not represented. There are important figures who have no, um, no, no place in the landscape. You know, I, I was one of those who campaigned to put the arch um, by Hyde Park for the, the Commonwealth troops who died in the world wars. But to what extent is this government attuned to the idea that just because people are not white, they're not all the same? And I think uh, I'm tempted to say um, amen to everything you've, you've said there. I, I agree with you uh, one, 100 uh, percent. And I, uh, uh, of course, and that this is the problem with all of it, that we, we have to use some form of, 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 of shorthand because it is brought into the, the, the debate and it's a legitimate challenge that is, is, is put to me as a, a minister. And I think to, to your point, what, what I really want to see is more history, not less. I want to be celebrating all these untold stories. And actually, what was one of the things, one of the great privileges of being Secretary of State for Culture is uh, it passed some people by, but at the height of the COVID crisis, we celebrated a VE Day and then VJ Day. And some of the stories of the sacrifice from um, Commonwealth uh, soldiers, and indeed men and women, interesting, very interesting uh, stories for co contributions uh, from, from women as well, um, outside of the, the United Kingdom, I found fascinating. And it's another layer of breadth and complexity to our history, which, which I want us to be able to, to draw out. And actually, interestingly, on a, on a sort of slightly different uh, tangent, I was um, uh, speaking to uh, a, a gay history um, conference the, the the other day, celebrate and there's actually Chris Bryant has written a very interesting book about the the role of the the, the gay community at the time of um, appeasement and resisting appeasement. Again, another wonderfully rich chapter of our history. I I love our history and our heritage, and I want us both to conserve it so that future generations may enjoy it and pull out more and more richness from it, more and more stories about it so that people can understand how their families, their wider communities have contributed to that history. And it tells the story of our nation. And in telling the story of our nation, it also, because of the global role that the United Kingdom has played over, over centuries, tells the story of, of, of the modern world that we live in. Let me, um, uh, I'm going to take a question from um, Joanne Cash. Um, I don't know, if Joanne, can Joanne come on or shall I just read it? Okay, if it's okay with Joanne, Joanne, I'll just read. How will the Secretary of State approach selection to board? And I, I, I'd like, I think this is an incredibly important question, especially given what you said about your desire to trust those who are um, given the stewardship of these institutions. Um, and I just want to sort of tack on a question to that. We've seen recently um, in the commission set up by the Mayor of London that however that group was selected, it was selected, but they have essentially parted company with, I think, the first name on their list, who is a man subsequently discovered to have described, um, uh, I think, Diane Abbott as a racist. I, I may not be exactly right on that, but something in that territory. Now, you might say that's just loopy, but actually, is there a problem here that the selection process that we have is simply confining itself to people that are already known, and also when it reaches out, it reaches out into the strangest and oddest places. Uh, well, I think it's a, it's a very important challenge and I have sought to ensure that we refresh the, the leadership of our institutions. That's why we, we have a presumption against reappointment. So there's quite a high bar before we allow somebody to be reappointed for precisely that, that reason that uh, I want to ensure that 
Uh, we don't have the merry-go-round where it's the same old relatively narrow group of, of people that, that hop from one institution to the, the next. In terms of my role as Secretary of State, that there is an independent recruitment process. I set the criteria and those are published criteria for what we're looking for, so what essential, desirable and so on. And I do that in consultation with the institutions as an independent process and at the end of it, um, I'm given a list of uh, candidates deemed appointable and make a selection from within those uh, deemed appointable candidates. So the, the crucial thing for me is making sure that, that we, we fish from a very wide pool to ensure that we get um, good people through and we have a rigorous process of, of, of recruitment. The um, Ruth Dudley Edwards has asked an interesting question. She says, knowing that the Cabinet Office, having studied the relevant research, abolished pointless, expensive and often destructive unconscious bias training a few months ago. Not sure that's true, but anyway, let's assume it has. Will the Secretary of State have a word with Tim Davey, who is introducing it into the BBC? Uh, well, we're, we, 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 we're talking, we've talked about... Um... We've talked about contested heritage. I think I'm going to confine my remarks on this call to uh, contested heritage and not talk about the, the, the BBC any further than I have done or, or already. I think let's, uh, let, let's save the BBC for another day. Okay, so, okay. Tim, Tim Davey wipes his brow. Javier Prez says, would the Secretary of State welcome counter monuments to statues commemorating colonial heroes? There are many in Germany, few in the United Kingdom. It's an interesting question. Uh, what I, I'm trying to think what the counter hero to Nelson might be, you know, um, a, a slave, um, uh, a slave uh, leader like, I, I don't know, Cuffey, uh, the, or he wasn't ours, but Toussaint Louverture, let's say, um, uh, on the opposite corner, on the fourth plinth to balance Nelson. Well, I, I certainly, I, I want more history. And if there are interesting stories to be told, I think we should be telling uh, those stories first. Secondly, I think for some of the, the uh, for example, take the Colston statue before it was torn down, there were some interesting ideas about how there could be more context given uh, around that so that the, the, the wider story of the man could be told and the so we didn't shy away from his uh, links to slavery. We brought those out to the forefront for people to uh, understand it. I'm certain, I, I certainly think that's uh, an interesting way of ensuring that, uh, that, that we do the explain part of things. What I would just want to ensure is that, and obviously this won't be my decision, this is up to local authorities or the institutions. So my, my question would be, um, if it's done in a meaningful way and not a tokenistic way. That's, but if it can be done in that way, then I think the, the richer the story we can tell, the better. Okay, we have to move to an end now. I just want to ask you a couple of closing questions, really. Um, first of all, the, the, the word that there's no sure is decolonization. Um, what do you understand by that? And are you for it or against it? And secondly, um, this is, in some senses, and uh, I, you know, I, I have maybe approached this sometimes in a slightly jocular way, but this is, uh, has become a very serious business. People have lost their jobs. There are people who are constantly feeling that they are um, unable to speak uh, their minds or to offer their views. Uh, the novelist uh, Kazuo Ishiguro uh, is reported in the Times as saying that he, uh, though he himself is protected by his Asian reputation, he worries for uh, young writers who feel that they cannot actually speak honestly or write honestly uh, about their film themselves or the stories they have in their mind. He calls it a dangerous situation. Now, this is all a bundle of very difficult territory uh, in which people are still finding it quite hard to talk to each other, though I have to say today has been um, a step away from all of that. Uh, and I, you know, well, I'll say something about that in a second, but have you got the stomach for this kind of fight? Because what governments tend to do is try to war wrap a warm blanket and walk away from it. Well, this, Joe, you, you've sort of posed about five questions in there that I will, I will try and sort of um, address. Yes, I, I saw 
Cassio Shugo said, and um, I, I, it is something that worries. I think the thing that the, possibly the worst things are the things that you can't see at all, which is the self censorship that uh, undermines one of the greatest strengths of our uh, liberal democracies, which is open and robust challenge, free speech, freedom of, of expression. And I do worry that there is a how we, and this cuts across many areas beyond mine, mine is just one example of this, how we ensure that we do have that robust and um, open uh, debate. On the um, the point about um, de decolonization, well, I'm sure uh, doctrinal theses could be written about the meaning of, 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 of <laughs> decolonization. I suppose what, what I would say is that what I'm keen to do is ensure we tell a rich story of our history and that that does not then descend into removing chunks of our history or rewriting uh, chunks of history in a, a way that isn't based on rigorous, um, uh, rigorous and empirical uh, basis. And we, we ensure that decolonization doesn't become a way of just telling an alternative uh, narrative, which is which reflects a different set of political um, uh, beliefs. I hope, I think, maybe I didn't yeah. answer your final question, but I hope I, I list that. Do, do tell me when you come back on. No, I think that, um, right, and I, if I may say so, uh, Secretary of State, I think that rather sums up um, what has happened in the, the conversation that I have heard today. Um, one of the uh, things that I, that we hoped we'd be able to do in this conference is to get away from people using history as a combat weapon in order to damn somebody else. Now, um, uh, I think it was very striking that in the previous panel where we had uh, Samir and um, uh, Laura Brockhoven from, von Brockhoven from Pitt Rivers and Sharon Healy from the Muslim Association, and Ian, Ian Blatchford, from, Blatchford from the Science uh, Museum, who all have rather different views, that we, they were able to have a very robust conversation but reach what I think is actually two points of convergence which you have emphasized. First of all, even if you think about decolonization, this should not be about simply imposing a new alternative narrative, but it should be filling in the gaps, offering different experiences, creating, adding to what we already have. And similarly on the physical landscape, that the aim should not be to start by knocking things down, but to start by thinking, how do we add to understanding either by text or actually possibly by physical object? And that, maybe that's my last question before I have to wrap up. Uh, are you an add more statues man or are you happy with what we've got? Oh, I'm definitely an, an add more. And I think actually we can, uh, yeah, as, as we recover and build back better after COVID, the opportunity to enhance our built environment in a way that builds a strong sense of place that people can identify with, particularly as people work from home more and all those sort of things, they, they, they look at their local communities more. I, I think there's huge opportunities. I just take, for example, one in, in Stoke, where I've been in touch with local MPs about taking some of their historical um, buildings from the previous industrial revolution and using that as a way of keeping the fabric of those buildings, using it as a way of housing the next generation, the sort of tech generation. I think actually by putting them in those historic buildings, you build much more of a sense of place than knocking those buildings down and, and, and building something of, of the sort of um, the, 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 the modern um, vernacular. And I think uh, in conclusion on this, you, you said, do I have the, the, the stomach for this? Is uh, Do I just want to chuck a warm blanket around it? I think that I... I don't want to have a sort of permanent uh, fight over this. I want to ensure that we have robust, healthy institutions that have robust processes in, in place that ensure that they have the, the independence to take the long-term view of our, our heritage and preserve it for, for future generations, but not to do so in a way that, that tries to put one narrative our past uh, over another or tries to preserve our, our past in, in aspic. I think it... It's we get far more from our history by doing that. Secretary, thank you very much indeed. Um, to our audience, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this is the first of these events from Policy Exchange. We will next month uh, be doing some a similar event 
and we'll be joined by the university's minister, Michelle Donnellan, uh, to think about curriculum in schools and uh, in higher education. Um, we, in the next phase of our work, are going to be focusing on trying to develop some principles uh, and the Secretary of State in what he's been saying today about uh, his views and where he thinks intervention might be necessary and so on, has helped, I think, to focus our attention on when do we need to th change things, why might we need to change things, and then how do we go about that in terms of process. And we uh, at Policy Exchange hope that we will be able to uh, make a contribution, I hope a leading contribution, to uh, coming up with principles and a process that will help uh, the sector and the nation as a whole to find our way through some of these very difficult questions. So once again, thank you very much, Secretary of State. Thank you very much to the Policy Exchange team for managing it today. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And I uh, hope that you will join us for our next go at this next month. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye.